podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Network's on Saturday, November 28th, 2020, this is episode 1749. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. This episode of the Tech Guy is brought to you by LastPass. Give your IT and security leaders control of password security with the award-winning LastPass. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. Why, hey, hey, how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. Time to talk computers. Yes, the internet. Well, maybe. <laughs> Home theater, digital photography, smartphones smartwatches, you know, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. If you want to talk high tech with me, I'd love to talk high tech with you. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada outside that area. You could still reach me. You just got to use, you know, Skype out or something like that. And then you can call. 8888 Ask Leo. Uh, there is a website associated and that's there for your amusement, entertainment, and informativation. Informatization. You know, to keep you informed. It's techguylabs.com. And it's written in English, unlike what I just said, uh, by our fine scribe, James DeRufo. Techguylabs.com. That's free, no sign up, nothing. Just wander in, uh, and you will find it. You ever buy shoes from Zappos? You familiar with Zappos? Uh, created by a brilliant guy. Man, this guy, just fascinating. Tony Shea. He um, he was, I think, in his in his twenties, like mid twenties, when he founded Zappos. Uh, before that, Link Exchange. Remember that? He created Link Exchange in his early twenties. Sold it to Microsoft for two hundred sixty-five million dollars, and then created Zappos. Uh, which was, you know, his great creation because it was a shoe store. Amazon eventually bought it. They had to. That was better than than uh, Amazon. That customers came first. My friend Jason Rapp tweeted uh, today about uh, Tony. Uh, <laughs> he remembered a time when he ordered something from Zappos and... Uh, that was delayed. It was, well, I guess uh, something went wrong with the computer system, as happens, right? And uh, a bunch of deliveries were delayed or didn't work out. And Tony sent an email to everybody whose uh, delivery was delayed and said, well, I am so sorry. There's no excuse. Terrible. Here's what you should do. You should call our customer service reps and make them do something humiliating. Have them sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star or uh, imitate the Wicked Witch of the West. Do something if that makes you feel better. He grew up in uh, San Francisco, graduated from Harvard with a degree in computer science in 1995, um, founded Zappos, worked to transform downtown Las Vegas, and to some degree succeeded. Retired all, uh, earlier this year after 20 years at Zappos. He's only 46, young guy. Maybe he had a feeling, I don't know, because he passed away uh, this week at the age of 46 yesterday day after thanksgiving <sighs> so so sad he anybody who knew uh tony uh and i only i only knew him peripherally i remember meeting him at south by southwest he was driving a party bus <laughs> this is when he was ceo of zappos but anybody who's ever ordered shoes from zappos knows what an amazing experience that was and uh and how he transformed e-commerce uh, not sure what happened, but it's it's a terrible tragedy. Tony Shea, uh, so young. So I hate to begin on a sad note, but uh, I think I th I think it's important to mention this guy uh, because he was he was really uh, to many people in uh, Silicon Valley a mentor, a leader, an inspiration. He was a 
um, really important guy that probably a lot of people don't know he existed. But, uh, but, but in Silicon Valley, we knew. We knew. Ah, sorry, to, sorry to bring you down. Cheer you up. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I did because uh, on Monday I got a new, uh, new baby. Well, not a baby, but kind of a baby. It's a laptop. Can you call a laptop a baby? It's my baby. It's the new M1-based, Apple Silicon-based MacBook Pro. Been playing with it for a week. <laughs> just couldn't, can't take my eyes off of you. You're just too good to be true. Um, very impressive. Very fast, very snappy. Uh, lives up to the uh, promise. Man, the battery life. Holy camoly. You just, you know, you just don't run out of battery. You know, you kind of, <laughs> you run out of energy. You run out of steam before you run out of battery. That's for sure. Um, runs cool. Runs fast. Gets a lot done. The only, there's a little bit of a negative. We knew this would happen because it's a new kind of chip. It's not an Intel chip. This is Apple's first uh, foray away from Intel. Which, which the rest of the industry uses for their computers into its own chips that it's designed itself, just like it does on the iPhone and the iPad. And so that's a, you know, when you do something like that, it's a big deal. That's a big deal because you got to get all the software to run. And of course, Apple's software, including its operating system and everything, run beautifully on this M1 chip. But, uh, and then they put in a little, uh, what they call an emulation layer, they call Rosetta 2, that... Uh, if you have an Intel program, you can generally it'll run pretty well, and it, and they do. In fact, in some cases, they run better than they would on an equivalent uh, Intel Mac laptop. Many cases, most cases. There's a little disappointment in my heart because a lot of the weirdo stuff that I use doesn't work at all, and it's mostly uh, development stuff, programming languages, and command line tools, weird stuff that probably Apple doesn't really, you know. They, they understand that's, you know, they're going to leave some of that behind. But it's kind of, it's a little sad for me because it's, a, it, it's kind of a change. I guess this was inevitable. Uh, the, it's a fork in the road for personal computing. And we're actually heading into an even larger shift in the next year. Uh, in 2021, Microsoft's going to do uh, uh, really something they call Windows Virtual Desktop. WVD, a terrible name. Okay, I admit it, awful name, but I'm sure they'll come up with something better because WVD doesn't sound like something you want. But uh, the idea is instead of having a Windows machine on your desk, uh, you have a, a anything machine, anything to run a browser, Chromebook, whatever, a thin, what sometimes they call it a thin client. It's not a powerful thing, but it runs Windows in the cloud. Your, your Microsoft... Office, your Microsoft Windows, your apps are all living on a server out there and you're uh, streaming it like you would Netflix to your computer. Gaming's already doing this. Google's done kind of an interesting thing with gaming called Stadia. Microsoft's doing something called xCloud. Sony uh, has been doing this for a while. NVIDIA, the makers of the graphics cards, have been doing it. And it's it's very, it's really interesting because it's... um. Uh, it means you don't have to have a very powerful machine. You could even use a mobile device to run Windows. So that's one fork in the road that we're headed towards. And I think really uh, for people who use Windows, that's going to be kind of the dominant way it's, it's used. It takes time. These things take time. Remember um, years ago I said, oh, don't buy CDs. It's all going to be digital. Well, it's taken time. Still, People still buy vinyl records even. But for the most part, your music is streaming. More and more of your TV shows are streaming. Pretty soon your computing will be streaming. And that's where Windows is headed for a variety of reasons. Uh, Apple's gone a different route. They've made a consumer appliance that's super fast, super slick. And it is a powerful computer on your desktop. But it's, a, it's an appliance nonetheless. And so... It works great if you use the you know prepackaged tools they expect you to run, and I think over time these are going to get even faster. This is just the first one. Uh, already rumors of a new uh, series of MacBooks with a new chip, dubbed by some the M1X, that will be you know even more impressive. 
But that's what's interesting. In the Intel world, in the Windows world, it doesn't matter what you've got on the desktop. It's what matters up in the cloud. So Apple's kind of making this, uh, uh, I don't know, very fancy, beautiful, elegant, super speedy, super great battery life computer. That's, that's a, it's kind of a fork in the road, right? It's a different direction. And then there's a third fork in the road, which is people who are developers who write software, who want to do hardcore stuff, and they're going to probably end up using Linux computers on Intel. That's a small slice, but it's an influential slice because they're writing the tools everybody else is using. A lot of students studying uh, computer science, things like that. So now you have these kind of three roads that are leading farther, diverging farther and farther apart in computing. I guess that you could include a fourth road, which is what they call computing at the edge, your Internet of Things devices, your your smart TV, your smart doorbell, your smart microwave oven. Those are computers too, but they're not, you know, they're purpose-built Internet of Things devices. So four, really four big shifts in computing in different directions. I think you're going to see, uh, you know, Apple probably do glasses. You'll see computing in your glasses, your earbuds, Computing at the edge. It's very, and they all have different uses and different purposes. We've come a long way from the early days when it was just, you know, <laughs> this this piece of hardware on your desk that did stuff. It's very interesting. Anyway, uh, my my impressions of this new Mac, uh, and uh, I think of future Macs are really really beautifully done, elegant, but maybe maybe uh, an idea whose time has gone, possibly. Huh? 8888 ask Leo that's the phone number we can talk high tech I'd love to whatever you're interested in you know we're we're you know we talk about these highfalutin ideas but it's still can I get my printer to work that's still what most people care about and that's what we'll talk about 888-827-5536 hope you had a lovely Thanksgiving nice little break now it's time to get back to work ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages <laughs> join me now with a polite golf clap for the unbreakable Kimmy Schaffer. <laughs> Hello, Kimmy. Good uh, day. Good day. <laughs> Did you have a lovely Thanksgiving? Yeah. Did yeah. you have a turkey? I had a turkey. I had my traditional uh, lasagna because I don't like turkey. I like lasagna better. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, nice. very intimate. Just you and your mom and dad? No, me, mom, dad, brother, his woman, and um, my one aunt. And outside, because he's got a big acre property, oh, so we were so able we're to all set outside. tables yeah. outside. Yeah. Nice. Throw dinner rolls at each other. And it wasn't too cold? We had a kind of no, a No, it was a mild day. Yeah. yeah, nice. I was a little afraid, you know, we, didn't, we were thinking of doing that, and then we decided, in light of the CDC's recommendation, just to have a quiet pod Thanksgiving. Well, that's, you know, that's kind of been our pod, too. That's your pod. <laughs> well, Not I much hope, of a pod. I hope everybody enjoyed the pod and uh, and stayed safe. And Well, uh, and I think healthy. a lot of people listened because uh, I had to go from Marin to up here to Santa Rosa. And was there quiet. was not a stitch of traffic. Yeah. So it was the, the best <laughs> commuting <laughs> Thanksgiving ever. Well, um, interesting because, uh, well, we'll talk to Johnny Jett in a little bit, our travel guru. But I, I think that the air travel was through the roof. But we'll oh, see. Yeah, we'll it find was, out. Yeah. Yeah. Who how, should I uh, who should I start with? How here, about uh, Gary and Dana po Dana Point? Oh, beautiful Dana, Dana Point. Point. Thank you, Ms. Schaffer. You're welcome. Hello, Gary. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Good morning, Leo. Such a pleasure to talk to you again. Nice to yeah, talk again. First one on. Good to so talk to you. I have a bit of a dilemma in upgrading my laptop. It's time for me to upgrade my laptop, and the home shopping channel had this great computer on it. It was 800 bucks. It was uh, HP 17-inch i3 with an 8 gigabyte RAM and 512 gigabyte solid-state drive, touchscreen, DVD writer. I mean, it had all the bells and the whistles. Okay, just the fact that it has a DVD uh, writer in it tells right. me it's know, it's right? a couple years old, okay? Movies. And this is one yeah. thing to be aware of when you're buying on the shopping channels is those are, and this is somewhat true of the big box stores as well, they're never the latest models. So... You know, what I would do is go to hp.com and just compare before you buy it um, to make sure that it's a, you know, that's a reasonable price and it's not too out of date. For instance, that i3 processor, which I generally don't recommend to people, 
uh, it might be not, you know, did they say what generation? Of course they didn't. It's sixth generation, seventh generation, eighth generation. Yeah, I don't know. But my dilemma now is they've come up with an even better one, an HP 15 with an Intel 10 generation i5. Yeah, there you go. That's a little That's a little bit better. You want 10th generation if you can get it, yeah. But it has a two terabyte hard drive as opposed to solid state. I know that you said uh, yeah. that. Yeah. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. A spinning hard drive. Yeah, I'm not crazy about them. Uh, honestly, that's okay. going to slow you down more than you think. And while it's a much faster processor and probably a later generation, I don't recommend buying from the Home Shopping Channel. I would, I would, I would look. Uh, I mean, if you got an amazing deal, okay. But in general, you're not gonna get an amazing deal. Um, there, there's a variety of reasons companies sell on the Home Shopping Channel. Usually, it's to move a lot of out of date units. So right. I would at least go to HP.com and look at a comparable device. The problem is they're not going to the model numbers won't be the same because they you know they right. cleverly change the model numbers and all of that. Uh, I think i5 is what you want. I think okay. solid state is what you want. You want 16 gigs of RAM preferably. What do you do with your computer? Uh, in real estate, so I do a lot of photos and videos. And okay, so you want a decent online. you want some decent speed. Uh, yes. And and I think you do want an SSD. That that is going to make more of a difference, frankly, than the processor in terms of speed. Okay. So I would, if I were you, I would even look at uh, refurbished computers from HP or or Dell or Lenovo. Um, uh, this is a good time to buy because of Black Friday. The companies are getting very are very aggressive. I think um, with uh, their pricing right now. Lenovo, I, I'm seeing, for instance, on the. Uh, Lenovo uh, X1 Carbon, which is their highest and most beautiful thin light, is uh, as much as two thousand dollars off. So, wow. uh, yeah, I'd go to Lenovo.com. Compare. Uh, you do want an i5. You want 16 gigs of RAM. You want an SSD. I think a terabyte is enough. But if you if you store a lot on your hard drive, two terabytes. I I generally get two terabytes because I don't. I'm lazy. <laughs> I just want right. to have it all be in in the laptop. Do they make a two terabyte solid state now? Oh, absolutely. I'm looking it's at one. Expensive, though, right? Yeah. Uh, they're getting less expensive uh, all the okay. time. Um, and in fact, that HP might be, it might be, might not be easy to replace the uh, spinning drive with an SSD. Um, but it's hard to tell because, again, that model number probably isn't a real HP model number. So you can't go to somewhere like iFixit.com or YouTube and get videos. Many laptop can you can open them up put a new hard drive in but many others right. especially more recently as they get thinner things are glued in they're not they're no user serviceable parts inside so it's worth checking i think this is a good time to be buying uh two terabyte uh, scooter x in our chat room is giving me a price check price check on a two terabyte samsung 970 evo plus which is a very nice one 250 bucks on amazon today so the prices on ssd have dropped dramatically and I think it really makes a difference. It's worth getting. Nice to talk to you, Gary. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This thing, this thing here, this thing here. Could you try again? No, go away. Okay. <laughs> well, that worked. This thing here is so speedy. Let me let me do the Craig Federighi. Let's see if we can just quickly. How quickly we can open it. Oh, it's already on. <laughs> ah! You saw that. Quickly. Quickly. Very quickly. But that's, that's not how we measure. Here, let me uh, launch uh, Microsoft Word. That would be a good test, right? This is the uh, the beta of Word that is um, running on Apple uh, Silicon, not, not an Intel one. So one, two, three, click. Oh, that's slow. What's going on? Did I not click it? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's a little slow, isn't it? It was faster the first time I did that. Let's do, let's see Excel. Let's see Excel. Might be checking licenses. Oh, you know what? Is this even online? <laughs> Let me see. Oh, it is. It, it knew what, it knew my Wi-Fi. Well, that's not that impressive, is it? Let's, uh, let's close that out. Let's close out Safari. Let's close out a few things make some space here we go let's just launch safari see how fast safari launches that's pretty quick they didn't even, didn't even get to bounce the whole time
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What is hip? Tell me, tell me, if you think you know. I think it's Scott Wilkinson. He is our hey. resident hipster. Hey, Scott. Home hey, theater Leo. geek. How you doing? Contributor to techhive.com. Do you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, very nice. Good. Very, very small. Me, me and my wife. And, Perfect. Uh, That's all you need. A little bit of turkey and a little, little bit of uh, mashed potatoes. Some delicious pumpkin pie from Republic of Pies. Mmm. Yum, yum. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So, um... I'm low? No, you're you're high, man. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> not you, but that's me. I, I have to adjust it. Uh, that was our... Okay. Uh, yeah. You could hear that? Yeah, sorry about that. She, she, I could. You could hear her? Oh, that's interesting. They can hear you, Lady Laura. Be careful what you say. <laughs> well, I can. <laughs> So I imagine a few people took advantage of Black Friday deals. Hey, oh, before we get into that, let's, we forgot last yeah. week, plug Tuba Christmas, because this is a, oh, a, I would love an to. annual tradition in the uh, Southland. It, they're held all over the country, yep. but you are the director of Tuba Christmas L.A. That's right. A uh, hundred tubas playing Christmas music and some Hanukkah music. Uh, of course, this year we can't do a live concert. It for the first time in 45 years, we can't do a live concert in LA. So oh. instead, we I know it's a bummer. So we're going to do an online event, and the advantage of that, of course, is that anybody in the world can tune in. Uh, so I encourage you to go to 2020.tubacristmasla. Dot com, And that will redirect you to the Tuba Christmas LA YouTube page where we will have the live stream on Sunday, December 13th at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Nice. We're going to we're going to have some uh, some specially made videos. We can't do a live concert online, obviously, because the latency uh, in, on the Internet just doesn't allow people to play oh. music together. Oh, uh, so we're going to we've, we've got a couple people doing some special videos performances. Uh, we're going to show some videos from past performances and we're going to have some live chit chat with some tuba notables, including Jim Self, who, you remember the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Yes. Do, remember, do, that? Do, remember that movie? Ba, you remember? Ba. Right. And you remember the mothership yeah. was communicating with the guy with the synthesizer? Yeah. The voice of the mothership was performed by Jim Self. On a tuba? On a tuba. Yep. What? Yep. Yep. So he's going to be on, and uh, we we do they heavily lucky, process we'll that tuba? No, I, I recognized it as a tuba immediately. Oh, that's when hysterical. I first saw it. Oh, that's yeah. hysterical. So tuba Christmas, L.A. Everybody, this is great because you've mentioned this in years past, but you had to be in the L.A. area to see it. You had to be in the L.A. area, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so that was that you know that was great. A live concert is great. Don't get me wrong. Next year, hopefully, we'll be able to do a live concert. But this year, we're doing it online, and you all you have to do is go to 2020.tubacristmasla.com. Oh, hey, l you, listen you, to that. You, you, never heard, a you never heard "Deck the Halls" until you heard a hundred tubas playing it. <laughs> is there anything but tubas? They're all tubas. They're all tubas. We, I don't allow anything but tubas at Tuba Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> There's Scott up front with the baton. That is awesome. That's right. <laughs> do, you, do you wish you could play in Tuba Christmas? Oh, I've, I played for many, many years in Tuba Christmas before Jim Self, who was the director before me, handed the baton over to me. He had done it for 35 years and said, okay, I've had enough. You want to do it? Wow. And I said, wow. sure, I'll what do fun. it. How many people show up at that's a big hall there? Oh yeah, yeah. We we get eight hundred to a thousand people Holy in the audience. Cow. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you're not it's doing a twelve hundred seat auditorium. But in a way I there's a know, blessing because everybody can participate this year. Twenty twenty yeah, yeah. Twenty twenty dot tuba Christmas LA uh -huh. dot com. And uh, you'll Correct. find the YouTube channel. Go and channel. subscribe to the YouTube channel and click on the little bell icon. You'll get a notice. You'll get a notification. Oh, good. Uh, when the when the show is about to start. So, so, you, so it will be, be kind of a of live fun. show. Just It will. It will. You have to be there at the, the time. The music will be pre-recorded. Yeah. Yeah. The music will be pre-recorded, but the, the, sh but the, 
the show itself will be live, and I'll be live with with a bunch of people actually. Oh, fun. Uh, different people, uh, including a guy who has attended every single Tuba Christmas LA since it began. <laughs> when he was a kid, he started. <laughs> when did and he now begin? he's bringing his kid. Holy cow. It began in 1976 oh in LA. My. 1974 oh completely. That's wonderful. I know, I know. It's amazing. All right. Now we can talk about TVs and Black Friday. Now we can talk about TVs. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? I wanted to mention uh, there were a ton of Black Friday TV deals, tons. Best Buy's first. 10 pages or whatever of their ad were just nothing but TVs. And a lot of them were remarkably inexpensive. But I noticed as I was looking through them that a lot of them were the very low end TVs of these various companies. This that, is this is so are, important to remember that uh, it, it's like yes. the last call when we were talking about the laptops they're selling on the home shopping channel or when you see them yep, in a big yep, box yep. store, but most especially yep. the doorbuster deals at Black Fridays. They These are yes. not typically the top of the line or even the most recent Correct. models. Correct. Yeah. Right. Right. Or the or the most capable. And most of them, we talk about LCD TVs, which is the majority, that are what are called edge lit, which means that the lights that illuminate the picture are around the edges of the screen. And but, it's simply not a very good way to do it. But it's cheap. But it's cheap. And so, I, I mean, not everybody can afford to spend $1,000 on a TV. So if you see... Well, a that's true, but you don't... You don't have to. But you don't have to. Yeah. No. Uh, the, the, the the brands that I recommend uh, for, for low cost are TCL. We've talked about that one quite a bit. And I, you, I, I recommend that you start with the Series 5. They have a Series 4, a Series 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. Don't go for the 4 or 3. The 4 was on a lot of Black Friday lists this year. And it's edge lit. Start with the 5. It's a little more expensive, but it's still way cheaper than a lot of TVs. Um, Vizio, start with the M series. They also make a V series. but And that's has a backlight that I approve of, but it's not nearly as good a quality as the M series. So you want to start there. Um, Hisense is another great... Chinese company. It makes very inexpensive TVs, but you, you don't want to go with their H6 series. You want to start with the H8. So so there are certain things to keep in mind, and if, they, if these are on sale, on a Black Friday sale, then by all means, grab them. Uh, LG, for example, most of their sets, most of their LCD sets are edge lit, so you want to start with the Nano 90 or above. Now, I will say this. Any OLED TV, you and I have talked about this many times, any OLED TV is fine. More expensive. OLED TVs are more expensive well, than some LCD TVs. Well, Tech in the chat room is saying Vizio has an OLED for 900 bucks. That correct. is more expensive. Vizio just more expensive than their LCD TVs, but less expensive than LG or right. Sony. Right, right. And still Uses would be the good. same panel. Oh, okay. And still would be great. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Any OLED TV is superior, in my opinion. The only drawback is it's not as bright. So if you need super bright, then you want to go LCD. But if, if you don't need super bright, OLED will give you a better picture every single time. All right. So I understand people um, have limited so, funds. I mean, goodness knows. Uh, well, sure, especially but, these days. And, yeah. and I don't want you to overspend, but sometimes you can also no. underspend. And so you know what we'll do is we'll all the. I, I hope James was writing that all down. We'll put all of those. Well, I've got a list too. I'll send it to you. Would you send it to send it to me and James DeRuvo, and that way we'll put it on the sure. website because you did this last yep. year, and then people will at least know yep. what model numbers they want to look at if they can afford it, and if not. You'll Correct. understand what you're giving up. And don't forget... Exactly. December 13th, 3 p.m. Pacific, 2020.tubachristmasla.com. Scott Wilkinson, thanks for joining us. Leo Laporte. Thanks a bunch. The Tech Guy. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> it's so funny that that's a tuba. Le that cracks me up. Thank you so, thank you so much for giving me so much time for Tuba Christmas. Oh yeah, yeah, really yeah. Now I noticed you hesitating. Is there some air, uh, issue going on with you and audio, or is there anything? No. No, you don't. There's a high pitched whine. No, I don't hear that. See, I don't hear that either. John and I were testing the about ten thirty this morning, and he he heard a high pitched whine. He even recorded and sent it to me. I didn't hear it in my 
in my feed, my feed, and I didn't hear it on that recording. I didn't hear it at all. Stop time for just a second. Let me listen. No, there's no high pitched whine, John. There's a. I've got my. I've got my. It's local to up you, John. High. It's local to you, John. It has to be. It's in the recording. Oh, I hear it now. Now it stopped. Yeah, it's like a teapot. Is there anything in your house doing that? No, I hear it. But it comes and goes. It's not all the time. No, no, it's in his house. That's coming through the mic. I hear it through the mic. Really? Mute, mute your mic. I've, I've mute your mic. mic. Okay, hang on. It's part of the background noise, I think. Yeah, it's coming through your mic. Okay, my mic. It's like is back a. T up. It's like something in the background. I've got my my overhead. No, 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 no. It's like a teapot. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's like a little. It's like a little alarm or something. I, I'm not. I'm nowhere near the. TV. No, no. It's distant. It's distant. Uh, it's okay. in the another part of the house. It's, Okay, well, I got my door closed. It sounds like a whistle. So well, that's it's distant. If it's if a I, low whistle. It's like a, if I don't if I turn I'm going to turn my mic off okay, right now. Okay. We hear nothing. And now my mic's back up. Don't hear anything yet. I didn't it, it's apparently it just comes and goes. <laughs> I can't. Oh, you know, we don't. Oh, I, I don't have a teapot. Turn off going. your mic, real quick. No. He said he heard it, but I didn't. I didn't hear it. But it, you were talking. Now I'm back up. I mean, could it be? I have my iMac next door. Or I mean, right next to me. No, no, it's not like that. No, you hear it right now? Oh, I know what it is. He knows what it is. I know what it is. It's this. <laughs> yep, that's it. That's exactly it. He's doing a fidget spinner. <laughs> I do it. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you need a silent fidget spinner. <laughs> I do need a silent fidget spinner. That's what it was. Oh, man. <laughs> It's a I have. I do a fidget spinner. It's a fidget spinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, my God, that's hilarious. Uh, that is what is hilarious. it? What is it? What is it? What could it be? Um. <laughs> oh my God! It's a fidget spinner. That's what it was. That's clearly yeah. what it no, was. No, it was mechanic. I, I could tell. It. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to stick around for the top of the hour? Not We've, oh, used, sure. we've used up all your time with the fidget. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> all right, thanks, Scott. With the fidget spinner now. <laughs> hey, you know what? The Tech Guy podcast brought to you, as it always is, by my friends at LastPass. I am a huge LastPass fan. I think you know that. Uh, by now, you've probably gathered that. I started using LastPass. I, I looked it up more than a dozen years ago when they first came out. But here's the thing that blew me away. I remember for a long time telling Steve Gibson, our security guy, oh, you got to use this. You got to try it. You got to use it. So he said, all right, all right. And he called them and he talked to the author of LastPass, Joe Segrist, one of the founders of the company. Joe said, all right, let me show you how it works. But in, you know, geek to geek, he showed him all the technologies, the, the actual code. Steve was so impressed. He said, this is, in fact, he did a whole show on it 10 years ago. <laughs> Ten years ago, he's been using it, and he's been using it ever since. LastPass is more than a password manager. It's everything you need for your business to take control of your identity and access management. That's a big phrase. really means take control of who's using what of your company assets, when and where. We love LastPass. We're not alone. Many awards this year, including... Uh, uh, the G2 Fall Grid Reports, that's a peer-to-peer -peer review site that 
provides unbiased user reviews on leading software solutions. 746 customers have left reviews. That by itself says something. Lots of people use LastPass. I think it is the most pa popular password manager. And of those 746 people, 93% rated them four or five stars. LastPass lets you take control of your password security. It gives you, your security people, your IT people, uh, complete insight com into what's going on in your organization with a central dashboard. You can see how people's password hygiene is view their scores. If somebody's not doing it right, you can help them do it right. You can teach them. But you get all that information you need. LastPass has all the features you need, too. More than 100 policies you can enforce. We, for instance, we've been using it in business for, I don't know, half a dozen years now. Uh, we tell people, you got to use two-factor. We require it. We have minimum requirements for uh, the master password, things like that. You can customize admin privileges so that you can give people admin access, but of the group that they're responsible for, you know, the business group or the engineering group or the ops group, that kind of thing. LastPass is also a great way to integrate with whatever you're using for your directories to onboard users, to sync groups, to revoke access. You can automate that control as well. I think LastPass is the easiest way, not just as a password manager, but to, to, to lock down your com final company resources. And with people working from home, on the road, wherever they are, with endpoints out there, LastPass is the best way to protect them. Employees like it, too, because it's very easy to use. More than 1,200 single sign-on apps. That makes it very simple. Um, it's a great way to share passwords. It's a secure uh, storage for everything. I keep my social security numbers and passports in it, my driver's license. There's a, uh, there's a reason. LastPass only decrypts the vault on your device. And by the way, every device you use, Android, iOS, Windows, Mac, Linux, every browser known to man. That's nice because it means I have access to my passport, for instance, when I'm traveling or wherever I am on my phone. But no one else does because it's only decrypted on device, never decrypted anywhere else. My master password is never transmitted anywhere, not to LastPass so I have absolute control of my information. And with multi-factor authentication, that means they start with two-factor, whether it's fingerprint or, or face recognition, iris, uh, a, a YubiKey. But also they go beyond that with multi-factor authentication, geolocation, IP address, things like that, contextual information that really means you know exactly who's using your resources, when and where. LastPass has won so many awards, eight of them this year alone, PC Magazine's Editor's Choice, the Fortress Cybersecurity Award, Business Insider's Best Overall Password Manager, and that's just a few. Look, you got to try it. If you're not using LastPass, why the heck not? Get to lastpass.com slash twit and take back control of your password security, especially in business. This is a must-have. LastPass.com slash twit. We thank you so much for the support of the Tech Guy podcast. Leo Laporte, the funky tech guy. Very, very funky. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Paul is in Seaside. Hello, Paul. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my call. It's great to connect with you. Love the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. In fact, I'm going to step outside the store. I got a mask on. So oh, okay. So I can hear me a little bit better. Yeah. Hey, uh, the recommendation from you guys about the LG. Uh, see, it would be the CX. Yeah, seventy-seven has been amazing. Let me let me let me let me put Scott on so he can hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you like the CX, huh? Oh my gosh! My wife said I could have a, a really good Christmas gift this year since we're not traveling, and so I did go with that one. And I watched uh, nineteen seventeen night before last. And oh, that's oh a good gosh. choice. Yeah, that's a very good choice. Yeah. So we're talking yeah. just for people who don't know what the CX is. That's an OLED screen uh with not only 4k but high dynamic range and that's a that's a good choice on a movie especially if you have good sound on that uh that, yeah that, that, well that's that gets you me to my like a sound bar or something like that well that's his question aha uh -huh. yeah so i have a high ceiling in my living room you know beautiful living room and all that but it's not the best for sound and i've been looking at the sonos at or uh, whatever the atmo no the sonos it starts with an a whatever the the higher end sound bar is that can do the Dolby Atmos. Um, you, Atmos isn't going to make any sense if you have a high ceiling, I don't think. Yeah. And is it a pitched so what, ceiling? Is it a cathedral ceiling? It is. 
It's a pitch ceiling yeah, and it's then, open then, going all the way through the kitchen. Yeah, the arc is not going to work for you because arc, yeah, it no. fires up speakers up at the ceiling and bounces them off. And it's going to fire and got, nothing's going to come back. It's going to bounce that way. That's right. <laughs> that way. Right. So what would you, what would you recommend? I'm afraid you, I mean, I'm, I sound bar. Well, if you really, if you really wanted Atmos, uh, you could put speakers in the ceiling, but you're, that's what you're going to have to do. And even then, Scott, if the yeah. ceiling's that far away and it's tilted, you're going to have. And it's tilted. It's really not going to work. Uh, the, the only way that I know to do it w right in that situation mm -hmm. is to hang the speakers on a pole <laughs> from now, the ceiling me, down to go with that. You know, Scott's a big feet. fan of Atmos. There's not a lot of Atmos Man. content, and it's only, I bet you 1917 has some Atmos because there's stuff exploding and things, but yeah, for, right. for most movies, there's not a lot of occasion for sound coming. What Atmos does is put sound above you. So your right. normal 5 or 7.1 system has a center channel, a left, right, if it's a 5-1, it has surrounds. If it's a 7-1, it has back surrounds and surrounds. Surrounds are roughly at ear, you know, going and sit, fire inside, firing into your ears. Um, and I roughly, think... Roughly. A little behind A little you. behind. But I think 5-1 really is kind of the sweet spot in terms of cost and doability. I agree. The surrounds agree. are a little and tricky you because you got to have wires going to the back of your room a little bit. Yeah. Not if you get a wireless surround system. Right. And okay. Vizio has a good sound bar with with a wireless surround, doesn't it? Correct, correct. Yeah. And sub and okay. subwoofer. You you definitely want a subwoofer. Okay. Subwoofer makes a huge difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You'd recommend them over a, a Bose or a Sonos? Yes. Yeah, I would. The Sonos oh, certainly Sonos, less expensive. Sonos's are really that arc is seven ninety nine. That's a lot. You can get the whole Vizio system yeah, it, it for is. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any, any model of the LG that you'd recommend? The uh, Vizio. You mean the Vizio? Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. No, they, they. I'd have to look them up. The models okay. are SB, and then two numbers that indicate how wide the sidebar is. So it, a sound bar. So it'll be thirty-eight or forty-two, and then five-one. And you you want to get one that okay. has actual physical surround speakers and a subwoofer. Um, okay. I think it's still only gonna. It's gonna be less than that at Sonos for sure. They're five-one system. Um, they have an M series and a V series. You know, M series is a little bit better. Get the M system. I think the M's yeah. are pretty good. You don't need the Atmos, obviously. The M Correct. includes the bar, which gives you a center channel left and right, and then the sub and the two surrounds. Yeah. And because it's wireless, yeah, yeah we had we we had a we actually had the Atmos version of that, and it sounded it sounded really good, given you know okay. that it's a sound bar. I, I'm a fan of having discrete speakers for all of that. But that's costly, and 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 you got wires. Yeah, running the wires is a challenge. Yep. So okay. Right. Do you have Thank a you so any receiver? I don't. I it's, it's, I've thought about putting a receiver in and going that direction. Well, yeah, that's the other expense of it. it the soundbar doesn't need it. You yeah. just take it uh, optical Correct. out of the TV. Uh, I have a Denon AV receiver as well. <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. so it, it all adds up. Um, I recently upgraded to ELAC uh, speakers surround, 5.1 surround with the mm -mm, nice den on. And I have to say, what? I was listening to the surround sound version of uh, Roger Waters' latest uh, concert, which John uh, turned me on to, mm. and it sounds beautiful. And we were watching something, and the walls were, oh, I think it was the... Uh, the flight attendant on HBO Max and the walls were vibrating. There was a lot of there was a lot of sub in that thing. <laughs> so uh, I think you get I think you get to be honest, you get more out of the surround speakers and the sub than the than the, you the Atmos. It's only some content that really uses it. John, it's really good when it's there. But. Scott loves it. He loves his Atmos, but I don't I don't miss it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks yeah. for the recommendation. Yeah, I really you're welcome. It. Yeah, yeah. Scooter X said he's he he had a problem with the flight attendant subwoofer but bass as well. What I don't I don't remember why there was so much bass in it. I don't think there was any reason for it. They just mixed it that way for some reason. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Scott, for sticking around. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Our show today brought to you. I love. It's always great that I can say. Well, let, let's ask our expert, Jose Ontario, California is next. Hey, Jose. Hello, Leo. Can you hear me? I hear you great. What can I do for you? Great. <laughs> uh, listen, um, 
I, um, on my phone, I can't connect to the internet. And, um, I installed a VPN, um, uh, two, three weeks ago and everything was fine. Um, and on my laptop, I can access everything. It's just my phone. I can't. So you're me. saying the phone could connect to data until you put the VPN on it. Correct. Is it an iPhone or an Android phone? It's an iPhone. Okay. So in order to use the VPN on an iPhone, you actually have to install a little VPN profile. I'm guessing that that's the problem. That's when it began, right? It, um... Well, it, it was working fine on my laptop and on my iPhone, and then all of a sudden, um, I went on to uh, I, to my laptop, and it asked me to enter my uh, username and ID, and I didn't, and it wasn't recognizing my password. So I changed. I went in, created a new password. Everything was fine, and then I went to my iPhone, and it started. Uh, first, it wouldn't accept like YouTube, then uh, you know uh, iHeartRadio. So let me ask you a couple of questions. When you say getting online, is it the cell phone connection, the cell data, or are you talking about Wi-Fi? Um, I think it's uh, I think it's Wi-Fi. It's when you're inside. Um, I mean, I haven't tried it uh, outdoors. But okay, so it's when you're inside. It's probably your phone's using your Wi-Fi. When you say you created a new password, what for a new password for the VPN for what? Correct. Okay. Correct. It just said that it wasn't a, it wasn't recognizing my old password, which I couldn't figure out why. But so I does the VPN a new one. Does the does the VPN service you're using allow multiple devices at the same time? Yes. Okay. Um, and and it works fine on your laptop, just not on your phone. Correct. Except for this password kerfuffle. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not sure what's going on. You can't. I mean, in the phone, in the on the iPhone, in settings, there is a VPN setting. And what I would do on the iPhone, it's in the general settings, VPN. Uh, look at your VPN configurations and see if you have one for that VPN. If you do, delete it and see if you can get online again. If you can, it was the VPN. Now, the next step is to call the company and say, what's going on? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All yours for oh, six yeah. minutes and nine Thank you so much. You know, I, I'm still astonished. I'm sitting here astonished that my fidget spinner, you could pick it up. I've been, <laughs> I've been fidget spinning for years on this show. Every, every time I'm on your show, I've got it below the desk and I'm fidgeting with it. And you, it, no one ever heard it before, but now you're hearing it? it? It's very strange. Now I know I won't use it anymore. I can be without my fidget spinner. <clears throat> okay, so, hey, everybody. So glad to be with you. Um, Howard says, I need a 43-inch TV, the Vizio M series, Quantum 43, not available. Money, no object, must be 43. Ooh, Money, no object, eh? 43 is pretty small. Uh, and if it can't be a 48, if money's no object and you want it small, I would say get the the LG 48CX. But it's 48. And if it must be 43, um, Vizio M series, does, does the P series come in a 43? I honestly don't know. Let's see here. P series. No, six starts at 65. M series starts at 40. Um, okay, well, let's see if the uh, the other ones I would look at are uh, Sony. Uh, I don't know if the X900 comes in that small, but I would look at that. Probably not, but it might. Um does the TCL Series 6 come that small? I don't know that either. But I would look I would look for the TCL Series 6 or 5. 6 is better. Uh, Vizio M Series, if, if it's not available, maybe they're temporarily out of stock or maybe you can find it at, a, at another store other than Vizio itself. Uh, Samsung Q80, I doubt, comes that small. Sony X900, I would... See if it comes that small. I bet TCL Series 6 or 5 uh, would be the other place to look. 
uh, aside from the Vizio M series. Uh, so that's, I mean, I would I would go look at Best Buy and Crutchfield maybe. Um, just look for the M series in a in another location. They might have some stock where Vizio themselves wouldn't. Uh, let's see. All right, I ping, I ping up ping, I ping you ping. <laughs> uh, replaced the soundbar, his soundbar with a Sony receiver, the 1080, uh, 7.1 Atmos. Thrilled with the upgrade. Glad to hear it. Um, Edmonton Oiler guy says Sony released firmware updates for the X900. Uh, okay, I wonder what it does. I'll have to check that out. Hey, loquacious. Always good to see you here. Uh, Kim says, I need to oil my fidget spinner. A little dab of WD-40. Okay, I'm going to try that. Definitely. Uh, Zufi says, uh, Element TV brand. Element is, I believe it's a captured brand, a captive brand uh, of Best Buy. Maybe Target? I can't remember now. Uh, any captive brand like Element, Insignia, Spectre, or Scepter, I forget. I think it's Scepter, uh, are going to be the lowest of the low end. So I generally wouldn't recommend them. Sorry to say. <laughs> Jamie says, only young ears can hear it. Well, I'm, that's not entirely true, I suppose. Um, Beatmaster, wouldn't hanging Atmos speakers create secondary reflections from the angled ceiling? Uh, yes, yes, but that would be minimized if the Atmos speakers that you hung up there uh, didn't, didn't have a rear port, for example. If they were ported but the port was in the front, uh, yes, sound radiates spherically from all speakers, but... Uh, some are more directional than others, especially sealed uh, sealed boxes or front ported boxes. So it wouldn't be that big a deal, I don't think. My ELAC uh, surrounds have por two ports. Yeah? On the front or the back? Well, they're on the side. So the front's here on the and they're on the side. I don't know if they're supposed to be up firing. But the way I have them is lying on their side, so they're firing kind of into nowhere. Does that matter? Uh, the ports, you mean? Yeah. As long as the ports aren't right up against the wall. No, they're not. They're firing into the room, well, kind of sideways. The speakers are firing at my ears. Seems like they are. Work. They? You said they're the debut. No, it, it's debut, but it's their. Uh, they have wall mount for um, the surrounds. I got to run it. Oh, and that's what you, those are what you have? Those are ported, yeah. Everything okay. else is ported, but it's ported, you know, in a, in a sensible way, but because those are in lying, a reasonable way, those are yeah. lying on their side, so the ports are firing kind of toward the TV. But it doesn't matter, right? The port is just... Anyway, I got to yeah, run. As long as the port isn't up against a wall, right. you're fine. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Have a great week. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here. The tech guy, time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, travel. Johnny Jett, our travel guy, coming up in half an hour. Biggest travel weekend, I believe, or week since the quarantine began. Uh, what does that mean? Johnny will talk about that. Cruise ships, are they coming back? There's, there's, there's some travel news. Some travel news. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. Ed's on the line from Huntington Beach, California. Hi, Ed. Yeah. Hi, Leo. How's Welcome. Going? Welcome. Oh, it's going great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Everything's good. But I do have a problem with my uh, 2018 Apple Air laptop. Nobody ever uh, calls me to say how wonderful their computer's working. So that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'll get used to it. <laughs> What's going on with your Air? I love the MacBook Air, by the way. Great, great laptop. It is, and, yeah. it, and it was, it, and it's, it still can be. But, um, and it was synced in really good. But now every time I open it up, 
it said this Mac cannot connect to the iCloud because of a problem with my email, and it wants me to open up Apple ID preferences, and I have to constantly put in my um, password. So, so you're logging in, and it's and it's logging in properly, but it, then it forgets it, or something goes wrong with it, and it has it forgets and, it. Yeah, it forgets it, and it even sometimes I have a VPN, and sometimes it asks me to re put in my password for my VPN. So I'm just wondering, is there such a thing as a virus that can get in? Somebody's looking at me and trying to get my password? Yeah, but that's not... Well, no. Apple's... Uh, this is a known problem. <laughs> uh, I thought they'd fixed it. I used to have this problem. It would ask me for my iCloud password again and again and again, and I found that very annoying. Um and then it went away, and I thought Apple had fixed it. So this is not unusual. Do you have you don't have two factor turned on? I don't think it sounds like it doesn't say it, it doesn't. I don't have two factor okay. where it has to ping my phone because uh, I have an yeah. Apple iPhone also. Yeah, you know the two factor on the Apple does a weird. It's not the normal two factor we're used to, where you look up an authentication code. It actually sends you a code to another Apple device. And it also shows you on the map where you're logging in from and stuff. I wonder if the VPN is is making it think, hey, this guy keeps logging in from Czechoslovakia. Is that him? Oh. Oh. So, so remember, VPNs oh. are going to make you appear to be coming from another locale. Oh. And I'm wondering if it just depends on the VPN. Some VPNs might move you around uh, without your knowing. I'm, I'm using the tunnel bear. Yeah, I would, I would, um, I would at least for a while, turn it off to see if that's causing the issue. Okay. Um, it could be, you know, Apple's pretty good on security. In fact, they're very good on security. And they're very, uh, I think sometimes some people, I often feel too secure. Uh, but can you be too secure? Probably not. And right. uh, I think when Apple's asking you for its password again, it's because it's something has happened okay. uh and, and i would start by by checking and because you might your location might be jumping around right yeah you know it it because of the vpn you you're, you're right because it seems to be going to the united states somewhere in the states like in the mid, mid yeah somewhere. and so that may be a, a triggering apple saying you know this guy <laughs> wasn't so long ago he was uh in uh, huntington beach and now all of a sudden he's in st louis I don't know about this. I don't know what's going. So it could be to protect you. So okay. I'm not sure. The other thing, uh, you have you tried rebooting your machine recently? Well, I I do a restart. Do, do I yeah, that's a reboot. That's fine. Um, there, that that was the fix in the old days. If you had a problem with the. This kind right. of looping, uh, asking for a password, sometimes rebooting fixed it. it. It used to drive me crazy, and I never did find a reason for it, except that uh, Apple says, oh, yeah, we had a problem, and we fixed it. I used to, it used to drive me crazy. Um, that you just, I mean, I just logged into iCloud. How many times do I have to log into this thing? So, But I would try turning off the VPN just to see if that's triggering it. A lot of times uh, that re-login is because, you know, it, it sensed something, some security issue, and it's and it's wondering what's going on. I, You know, I don't know. TunnelBear is a perfectly good VPN. I don't think there's anything wrong with TunnelBear. But it may just be the nature of it is is uh, causing Apple to go, hey, what? And 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 my iPhone, I have an iPhone 10, and it's also the mail has quit being synced up. So now my iPhone's asking me to put in uh, the, the password all the time too. So it's yeah, yeah, but but it's the same password. Nobody's changed it, right? It continues to work. Right, it's the same password. I yeah. haven't changed the password. I would, I would. Uh, the other thing you can do is go in your web browser to iCloud.com and log in and make sure everything's okay there. And where's okay. that at? Just go on your bra any browser to iCloud.com. Oh, okay. And you can log in directly as a, as a web page into it and just see if that's working okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and it might. I, I don't. I, I I hesitate saying turn on two factor because that make it may make it worse, <laughs> but it also may make it. It certainly will make it more secure. Um, so, but I don't need to go to the Genius Bar down at the Apple Store, right? I wouldn't yet. I would try turning off Tunnel Bear first. 
Okay. Um, and then there is, I'm looking at a page on the Tunnel Bear Help um, talking about some issues with iOS. I'm wondering if there are, you might, might go to help.tunnelbear.com and see if there's some specifics to having problems with iCloud. It might be there okay. is some issue there. Okay. Well, I sure appreciate that. Yeah, Leon, my pleasure. And you're always a wealth of information. So Thanks, thank Ed. you my again. Pleasure. Yeah, I love the. You know, that's the Apple's best-selling product, a best-selling computer product. The iPhone easily outsells everything, but for uh, for Mac OS, uh, that MacBook Air, it's a fantastic. They released another one earlier uh, this year, and now they've released one with this new chip. I have to say, having used it, uh, the new chip, I love it and everything. I do feel like it's the, it's clearly the future, maybe not just for Apple, but for desktop computing in general. I mean, it's an amazing processor, but there are still compatibility issues. And if you aren't, uh, if you don't have a hankering to use the newest thing, I would hold off a little bit at this point. If you cannot buy a new computer, I would wait. And uh, partly because the next generation of these will be even better. That's one reason. But also, it's going to take a little while for developers to catch up. This always happens when you get a new processor. Now you, all the software has to be redone to work with the new processor. Apple has an emulation they call uh, Rosetta, which is really clever. But it's not perfect. It doesn't work for everything. A lot of the things I use don't run under Rosetta, which surprises me a little bit. I use some weird oddball stuff, but that surprises me a little bit. That'll all, in a, in a matter of months, I think, be fixed. You know, I don't think it'll be too long, but just something to be aware of. If all you use is, you know, Apple software and, you know, Microsoft Office runs under it, I mean, uh, most normal, you know, commercial packages run just fine. But if you if you uh, have some oddball uses, then I, I wouldn't rush into this. In fact, there's a, a website you should probably know about called Is Apple Silicon Ready? That's what they call these chips, Apple Silicon. Is Apple Silicon Ready? And what he's done on, on this, which is really great, is uh, compile a list of stuff that works and doesn't work and how it works. And it's a pretty good list. So if you are thinking about getting a new Mac, and I know there's some people on the line who want some uh, advice, and I'll be glad to do that. But that's a good site to take a look at. Yeah, there's kind of a predictable cycle happening with the uh, M1 laptops. The first round is, wow. This thing is, first round is, I don't know, you know, Apple, first generation product. Then we start getting them and people go, wow, this thing is fast. Then the third part of the cycle is problems start to crop up. And people go, oh, oh. Uh, I'm a little disappointed because the programming tools I use don't work. Like Dr. Racket, I can't get any Lisp to run. And uh, that's kind of a, an issue because the uh, advent of code is coming up on December 1st. And I, I'm going to have to use the Dell laptop instead. Um, so that's that's going to happen. Um, there's, there are some compatibility issues. It's a big change. And not everything runs on a Rosetta because it's a lot more complicated than it was in the first transition. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Nice choice. Lady Laura, our musical director. Ralph on the line from Orange County, California. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Leo. What a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to talk to you, sir. So I think you may have just answered my questions, although I'm looking at the uh, website, Is Apple Silicon Ready? I'm, I'm interested in the tools that don't run, and specifically, can you still get to a command line, and what yeah. about the GNU stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have the, I got on Monday the uh, new Apple MacBook Pro 13-inch running on the new Apple Silicon, the M1 chip. People, For people who don't know, you know, most... Uh, computers these days run on Intel-based chips, the i3, i5, i7, i9, the Xeons. Uh, and for, for decades, uh, that architecture, we sometimes call that x86, the x86 architecture, has been dominant for 20-plus years. Apple uh, used to run on Motorola chips. Then uh, they made the shift to uh, in, uh, PowerPC, from uh, IBM, and then they made the shift to uh, Intel 15 years ago. 
and they've been running on Intel for 15 years. But on iPhones and iPads, they've been using their own chips, the uh, A series chips. And they've really got amazing performance out of these things. Great battery life, really powerful. And I think Apple quite probably rightly decided we should probably build our own chips for the laptops for Macintoshes as well because we've got a lot of expertise now. We've been doing this since 2007. We know how to do this. And we can make chips that are designed specifically for our software. And there's a lot to be said for that. They're optimized to run Mac software. So if you're using, and you know, so I've been playing with this, installing everything possible. If you're using Apple software, it has been rewritten, re actually isn't even rewritten isn't the right word. They don't have to rewrite it. They just run it through the compiler again and it, and it works now on M1. And all the Apple software works beautifully. Is much faster, much quicker to load, much quicker to run. I mean, we're talking sometimes twice as fast in some cases. So there's a that's amazing. And the battery life on this MacBook Pro, it's it's just I haven't been able to run it out. I mean, it's basically at minimum if I'm working it really hard nine hours, and more likely fifteen to sixteen hours, which is more than all day for me. So. Battery life is remarkable. It doesn't get hot. The fans never come on. It's funny because we now, having having torn this apart, we know it's identical to the Intel version. Even the fan part is the same. But unlike the Intel version, which got pretty loud when it was working hard, this thing never gets loud and never gets hot. Uh, I was able to warm it up a little bit running a giant motion um, uh, rendering, which is a 3D rendering program Apple does. Uh, for two and a half hours. It got kind of warm to the touch. That's all. But you mentioned the really what's going to be for some people a showstopper and a weak link. You mentioned the command line and the GNU utilities, the command line programs. A lot of them don't work. They will. Uh, even if you try to compile it, there are other issues involved. If you try to compile it yourself, it's a problem. For instance, I can run... Emacs, which is the editor I prefer, I can run it uh, as a under Rosetta, as an Intel app under emulation, and it runs beautifully and fine. But I like to use Emacs for software development, and I can't get a, a lot of the a lot of the languages I want don't run. It comes with Python, it comes with Perl, Python 3 is on there. So Apple's putting in a lot of the tools that uh, it knows you want. Xcode comes with Git and Curl and a lot of the tools you want. So I would say probably it depends a, a lot on what you want to do. Um, and that's going to be really for the next six months. People on the edge, people who do weird things, are going to find this to be a little bit less desirable. But people who uh, are doing mainstream things, even photographers... You know, Adobe Lightroom is going to be native. Photoshop is already out in beta, native. Uh, Darkroom and Affinity Photo are excellent. Uh, those are native. Uh, I was able to edit photos on this just fine. So most of what kind of mainstream users do is going to be just fine, if not vastly improved. What particularly do you want to do in the terminal? Well, mostly I just get a lot of joy out of it. Me too. Like <laughs> Emacs and Auk and crazy yeah, me too. Like that. Auk's in there, Sed's in there. Uh, uh, because Apple has a lot of these tools built in, uh, it doesn't. It has Vim, not Emacs. Vim runs native and fine, but Emacs is a little harder. You can't compile it. Do you use Homebrew or Mac Ports, one of the package managers? You know, I'm primarily a Linux user who uh, is just kind of interested in where computing is going in the future. So it's kind of sad to hear things yeah. going into the cloud and, and that kind of stuff. There's a part of me that I know what you really mean like to keep it on my box. So Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, said, boy, I would really love to see how Linux would run on an M1 Mac, <laughs> but it probably never will. Wow. What Apple has essentially done is made an appliance. And because they control every bit of the hardware and software now, they've pretty much locked it down. And I think if you're someone who wants to run open software uh, on open hardware, 
It's uh, it's sad because I I too like Linus. I would love to run Linux on this. I don't think we're ever going to get to. What's really sad to me is Macintosh was uh, a Unix. It was it's kind of based on BSD. It has a lot of Unix. And we're getting geeky here, folks. I apologize. We'll stop. <laughs> we'll stop this in a moment. But I can't resist talking about it because I think there is something happening here. And I mentioned at the beginning of the show there is. I think the computing world is starting to kind of bifurcate, trifurcate into different pieces. This is a desktop computer that runs beautifully as long as you're willing to treat it like a locked down appliance. And that's kind of how Apple is. You know, they want to be an appliance maker. Uh, and there's good reason for that. It's going to be simpler, more reliable, and most importantly, more secure. Uh, those of us who want to run, you know, weirdo programs we download from the internet... <laughs> We're going to have to use Linux, I think, because I don't think you don't. You don't think Linux is going to be able to to get on there. Linus didn't seem too uh, optimistic about it. Apple's done a lot of interesting things to make it more secure. Yeah, I think at some point in emulation, it, oh, in fact, it does run it as soon as the emulators are done. VMware Fusion and Parallels don't yet work, but as soon as those are done, Linux will run an emulation. But would you be able to, as you have been with older Macintoshes? Make this a Linux laptop? No. Really? I don't think so. I, it, it, well, yeah, I should never say never because... Well, it seems like Microsoft has tried to keep Linux off. Right, and they failed. Yeah, <laughs> they failed. In fact, they've given in. Um, <laughs> you know, never say never because the ingenuity of, of Linux uh, aficionados is unbounded, and I can imagine them already trying to get it working on here. <laughs> it would be an amazing Linux box... And by the way, Linux works great on ARM processors. So, but there are things Apple's done that are a little odd. The just-in-time compiling has highly locked down. There's a lot of things that are locked down that make it a little bit harder than just porting it over. So, I think this is really Apple's appliance more than anything else. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Coming up, travel time. Yeah, I, I, I probably shouldn't do this on the radio show because it's way too geeky. But I'm going to do a hands-on Mac on this. I, th I feel like Apple has, and I understand, I think it's probably the right thing to do, decided to make this an appliance. And if you're running Apple software or a properly configured third-party software, it's going to be great. I can't get Lisp, a Lisp to run on here to save my life. Really? Compiling from source, compile, you know. Not Mac natively. It'll, it, I mean, it's clearly running. No, it won't run. No, no. Well, yeah, Emacs will run. But uh, but a lot but it doesn't run well because of a lot of the uh, Emacs stuff that I use won't run. So I can't get a Lisp on here, which means I can't get Quick Lisp on here, which means I can't get Slime on here, which means I can't use Emacs for Lisp developments, things like that. <laughs> That's very weird and 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 outre and uh, probably not something ninety nine point nine percent of people are going to care about. For his advent of code is coming up December 1st. I'm really excited about doing that. And I, and I normally do it in a programming language called Racket. It doesn't run. Will not run. Um, uh, Matthew Flatt, who is one of the authors, has an M1. He's working on it. He says, I'm going to get it running. But it's hard because there are surprising roadblocks. Um, and And... It's not as simple as just getting it to run under Rosetta. It's not as simple as recompiling it for the ARM architecture. There, Apple is putting a lot of security in this. Um, and so I, my actually, my thoughts have changed. They're, they're in flux on this a little bit. So that's why I, you got me, Ralph, because I'm kind of interested in thinking about this. I feel like the speed and battery life on this thing is, is mind-boggling. Huh. But it's it. But Apple, I believe, for security reasons, is putting up some significant roadblocks. Well, it is fascinating just to watch how the industry has evolved. And, yeah, and how yeah. so many things that were developed in the '70s are still my favorites. So yeah, I really, yeah. <laughs> thank goodness you can. We still have Linux, and uh, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Linux would be great on an M1, but it runs fine on Intel. And, uh, you know, my Dell, I'm using a, uh, the Dell Developer Edition from uh, earlier this year, the XPS 13. It's spectacular. And I'm completely happy with it. So I'm just going to not be able to use It's sad to me because I wanted this to be the all-in-one computer that I use for everything. Huh. And it's not going to be, I don't think. It's going to be the, the kind of, 
you know, appliance computer. Yeah, I guess I don't really understand what an appliance is as opposed to computer, other than maybe you're just saying they've locked it down. Yeah. Um, it's purpose built to do the jobs that it does. It's hard to do anything outside of that. It's on rails outside of that, um, uh, you know, pathway, the mainstream pathway. And so you and I are doing stuff, you know, we want to do, we want to use, you know, uh, GNU utilities. We wanna, iTerm is native, runs great under M1. Love it. Uh, that's a great terminal program, runs great. Um, a lot of the things, I think in time, Vru will work and Mac ports will work and a lot of the GNU utilities. Apple provides a lot of the GNU utilities, as I said, like Git and um, uh, Curl and uh, Python 3's on here, runs fine. So... But I think a lot of the Python libraries people use may not run as well or, wow. or run at all. So that's the problem. Is is, and this may be fixed. It may be fixed. But I think really Apple doesn't see this long term. They want you to use Xcode to develop. They don't want you to use anything else. Yeah. So uh, I think that there's a there's a fork in the road. There's a tri tri fork. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. <laughs> hey, I have to run. It's really you got me going on this one. It's really interesting, Ralph. Um, it's it's a little disappointing, right? I'm a little disappointed right now because, yeah, I thought this would be the perfect you know command line, but it's not. It's they're 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 leaving behind. I think some of their BSD roots. Wow. Hey, I gotta go. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Take care. What'd you say, John? What'd you say? I said I've been nowhere lately. <laughs> He's been nowhere, man. Johnny Jet, our traveling guy. And actually, Johnny, it's starting to heat up now. It's starting. It's not. Yes. What's weird because COVID nineteen is also starting to heat up. It's as bad for as sure. it's ever been. But for some for reason, sure. maybe we know more about it. I just read a, a, a number of studies that say that airplanes are probably one of the safest places you can be. They'd be safer if they weren't selling the middle seats. Agreed. That's why you got to book Delta. Yeah. But uh, for starters, a lot of those studies were commissioned by the airlines. Right. So, you know, I do believe that their air filter systems are, are really safe. But if you're sitting near someone who has COVID, it doesn't you're, matter. You're, you're breathing their air. You're not yeah. breathing the, the filtered exactly. air. Exactly. Yeah. And but people are I able to get on planes even with the widespread testing uh, and, and, and spread it. There have been super spreader events. And then, of course, the airport's dangerous. The the ride to the airport's dangerous. Right. But well, but, I was, but I, tell I, me, didn't the TSA, what, what were the TSA numbers this week? Uh, the TSA numbers were huge, except for today and yesterday, which is expected. Um, yesterday, Thanksgiving Day was only like 500,000. Today was 800,000. But every every day this week has been almost a million or over a million. They had three days over a million people going through, which are huge numbers, the biggest since March 16th. Uh, so travel, people are definitely not listening to the health experts that the are CDC saying to said stay, home. stay home. Yeah. They're all saying stay home. We're I tired mean, most of it. the health experts stay home. Um, but I was listening to one doctor, Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Reiner. He's uh, the George Washington School of Medicine. He was like, listen, if everyone could just sit tight for the next few months. We're getting he a really vaccine. says, I really see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. The, I think the spring is going to be very good for us and summer is going to be amazing. Yeah. So that gives me hope. And I do think that um, people are going to be back traveling, especially domestically. Internationally, the uh, IATA came out this week saying it's going to be 2024 before international travel gets back to pre-2019. That's bad Love. news for a lot of regions that depend on tourism. It is, but one big reason is because of the vaccine is not going to be distributed everywhere. Right. I think I think the hot spots where we go, where most Americans go, I should say, they'll be in good shape, like Canada, Europe, or at least Western Europe, and um, and I would think some parts of Asia. So. We'll see. Might be safer. Uh, you might be safer in Asia than you are here, to be honest. Actually, they say Africa. <laughs> You're safer in Africa right now yeah. than you are here. Yeah. Africa's doing a great job. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Well, they have experience. Yeah, with Ebola and, mm -hmm. uh, and other. Mm -hmm. So, but that's that's some of the good news. Um, a little bit of bad news is Kauai just came out yesterday saying they're going back down to... Uh, no more pre-testing. You have everyone has to quarantine for 14 days, no matter what. If you're coming from another island or anywhere else in the world, starting on December 2nd at midnight, um, you're going to have to quarantine. 
because the cases have just run rapid, rampant. And I, I knew this is going to, and it's going to happen for Oahu and Maui. I, I predict, I, I hope it doesn't. I really hope I'm wrong, but you know, it's just not working. This, yeah. You know, that's the bad news, but the good news travel will bounce back. And there's some really good deals going on right now because of black Friday and cyber Monday, you know, a lot of the cruise lines, airlines, you can fly actually to Hawaii for $196 round trip from the West coast to, um, if I go to, to Oahu, all, do I have to quarantine? No, I have to just get tested, now, right? You just have to do a test. And it was the same thing with Kauai until is, yesterday the governor said uh, he he told the mayor he'll honor his request. And so they're going to go back down. Not not a lockdown, but they're going to say you have to – everyone has to uh, quarantine like they did before. Yeah. Just on the island of Kauai. Right. The Garden but, Island, beautiful place. I mean, it is it's one of the most beautiful places so, in the world. Do, 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 the cruise lines come come and go. We had that cruise last week <laughs> yep. that was uh, kind of a failure. And, big uh, time. Yeah, big That's time. Understatement of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I still see, in fact, the cruise stocks were going up because I still see cruise lines saying, yeah, we're coming back any day now. Listen, the, the, the consumers love cruises because it's such a great deal. I agree. And... And a lot of the ships have gone to the scrapyard, so they're saying there's high demand right now. And actually, because of um, Black Friday, they, a lot of them are offering like 20% off. And this is for future. No one's tr no one's cruising in the in the next few months. So, and we're hoping that you know people will be able to sail this summer at least, I mean, if not the the spring, late spring. But um, yeah, I mean, cruising, cruising is not dead. Believe me, it's not. I mean, I don't think there's anyone more passionate about travel than some of these cruise uh, fanatics, if you want to call them. They, I mean, they. I've met people who've been on 300 cruises in their life. I know it's crazy. I've I'm, been on maybe 30. I'm a cruise fanatic, but I'm having second thoughts. I have to be honest, not merely because of COVID, but also because of the environmental impact of cruising. And I'm thinking. Maybe uh, you but know that, that's an not. issue, but yeah. they're all they're all tackling it because that is definitely an issue. Right. And I know Sir Richard Branson, his sh new ship that was supposed to launch in boy, August. Boy, I mean, did he, he pick, pick a bad a bad time yeah. to launch that? <laughs> Actually, it was in March. I was supposed to go down in the March for the launch, yeah. and then they just kept pushing it. But um, when is he? When also, is that going to take uh, off? The the new Virgin Cruises. Are they? Do they have any plans? They keep pushing it. I you know I haven't looked at what the uh, latest is, but it will be. Once they open it up, they got to go. I mean, it's a brand new, amazing ship. It's kind of so, sad. Um, this gorgeous ship has just been sitting there. Yeah, um, my guess is summer is, yeah. it, is, is my guess, but yeah. we'll see. Um, I do have an app for you if we have time. Sure. Um, it's called get.santapixapp.com. Get.santapixapp.com. Okay. What do I get and when I, I get.santapix.app.com? Yep, Amber Mack tweeted it saying uh, it was uh, supporting Canadian women and entrepreneurs. Oh. And so since a lot of kids can't go to the mall and get a picture with Santa, you can Wait, bring Santa to your a house. Zoom picture with Santa? <laughs> it's not a Zoom. It's an AR. You know, I, I, I talked about one of these with the uh, astronauts, which was really cool. This one's okay. It's only 99 cents on iOS, $5 for Android, which I don't, I'm not sure why there's such a huge difference in that. But um, it's fun. I just did it upstairs with my with my kids, and Aww. you can move Santa around. And uh, so, if you want to support small businesses, which today is a small business Saturday, we all knew we all these small businesses need support. So I bought it. How do you spell Santa Picks? Is it P I C S? Uh, you know what? It's P I C S app. I'll put it in the chat room right now. G, G E T dot. Santa Picks, P I C S app dot com. Yep. And uh, I put it in the chat. And that is going to get you a. It, it's is it is it Santa's helper? Yeah, <laughs> no, it's Santa. It's Santa. Figures Santa, Santa would be uh, on top of AR. Works on iOS or Android. That's kind of cool. And they have little p props. You can bring a snowman in. You can bring a Christmas tree in. You can move them around. There's even video part. I haven't done the video part yet. Um, but listen, it, for the kids these days, it, it's something um, nice, fun instead of running out to the mall because nice. nice. I don't think you can do it this year at the mall. And, and by the way, it's the, uh, it's the uh, 
Coca-Cola version of Santa. <laughs> yes. If you know what it's I mean. Old, it's the old-fashioned, it nice, jolly old elf with a nose like a cherry. I I'll look love for it. A, I'll look for a better one for next week. What's wrong with that? And a portion of it goes to Canadian Red Cross and the Red Cross Violence Risk Reduction Program. And, so that's a and one cause. more thing that's in the news this week. Yes. This, this TikTok star, a fool, pretends he grilled a steak in a Delta bathroom. And he, and he took video of it, of like he's making a steak. He had a, a sterno. He lit oh, it. Oh, please. And he got so much grief. And then he made another video. Southwest Airlines tweeted it. Which was, was it real or mistake. was it fake? It was fake. All of, of it was fake. Of course it was. But, but it looked real. Dopes. And he really... Got people TikTok going, especially dopes. Me. They're the new my blood was boiling. <laughs> the new dopes in town. Johnnyjet.com. Go there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> TikTokdopes.com. Oh Lord. What are we gonna do? So let me um see I wanted to do the Viking um Mississippi cruise, but I think they're all sold out. They are. <laughs> For, in, they are. in 2022. But I think our trips, our first trips are going to be in the U.S., Lisa and I have decided. We're going to, first thing we're going to do is do a, a road trip up the East Coast, I think. Well, we're fortunate that we live in such a, first of all, beautiful Lots country and a beautiful state. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to see in America. And I think, you know, domestic travel is going to bounce back first, for sure. Leisure travel, business travel is going to take a while. They say that business travel is not going to bounce back. back until people go back to the offices. It may never come back. Why spend all this money? You could just Zoom it. It's definitely going to take a hit, big time, because, I mean, again, I used to go to New York City for a meeting. I had friends who'd go from New York to Australia for a meeting and not even spend the night. Those days are over, I think, and yeah. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. For everybody. Yeah. Especially the environment. I was going to do... Uh... New Orleans to St. Paul, up the miss, the mighty Mississippi. Uh, yeah, I it's, hope to be able to do one of those. Sold too. out in 2022, <laughs> <laughs> but I think 2023 has some has a few openings. <laughs> oh man, I would really like to do that, but I don't. I don't know if it's great. It seems crazy to yeah. The June 24th sailing in 2023. Is sold out. It seems, and then as is September 16th, 30th, there's only two sailings that aren't sold out the July 8th and July 22nd. It seems to me like it's crazy to make a reservation for a trip in 2023. It is. So if you are going to make those kind of reservations, you make sure get that you insurance. get your money back. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you got you to read the fine print for the yeah. insurance. But before I go, I got one more quick question about that fire stick for my dad's Roku TCL TV. TV. Yes. I went to buy it, and there's three different versions. Can I buy the cheapest version, or do I need the most expensive? Do I need the light or the... Didn't we say the cube instead? Did we say a fire stick? Did we stick? say the cube? I think we said the cube because we want voice commands, right? Right. I think we said the cube. All right. I'll get, go I don't cube. know. I don't know. Uh, you, he wants to be able to say, "Hey, turn on the races." races. Right. Or, I mean, right now the TV says you can tr you can tell you can tell, you know, a to turn on the TV and turn off. But he will, but she will, but she won't turn it to the actual programming channel guide. So it, then you have to have another step where you actually have to hit OK in the um, cable box or whatever right, it is. Right. App, not box. No. Most no. expensive people are telling me. Okay. Yeah, it does look like I'm in prison today. I, I'm not shaving. My son asked me not to shave. He, for um, Movember? He said, for Movember, he wants me to look like Santa because my oh, beard's you, coming in gray. Like and will. I'm like, listen. Actually, you're, like, you look like you will look like Santa. Like a young, I will. If I keep like eating, Santa when he was young. Thinking, I will. When Santa was young. Yeah. But I, I said, listen, I'm going to shave today. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's cute. So, you know what? What we'll do That's for our kids. That's so cute. Yeah, I know. Digging deep, the deep cuts from our Professor Laura, our musical director. Nice job, Lady Laura. Daisy on the line from uh, Alhambra, California, our next caller. Hi, Daisy. Hi, how are you? I am great. How are you? Mm. Oh, oh, Daisy, you're going to make me cry. What's the matter? Oh, I'm just trying to get through the day. I know how you feel, Daisy. 
I know. So, so. Yeah. My question is, um, in my house, I have a spectrum, and my um, internet connection, it says on my laptop that my brand width is is unstable. Oh, that's no good. For for like Zoom calls and things like that, or just for for surfing the web. For Zoom calls, how yeah. can I make it stronger? So Zoom, yeah. Zoom, and the and these video calls, they're hard. They're work making your computer work hard, and they're making your bandwidth work hard. Do you remember offhand, Daisy, what speed you you got from Spectrum when you when you bought it? Did they tell you what your bandwidth? It's like about two hundred. Oh, that should be plenty. That should be plenty. So. I would first thing I would do is check to see if you're getting uh your internet you, the internet speed that you want. Um you could do a what we call a speed test. Easiest way to do that is uh, is with Google. They have a speed test. If you Google how you know what? what? You know what I did. I didn't mean to interrupt you, interrupt you. But what I did is I I, I did something called the fast test and yeah. I did it on my phone and I went Around the house, yeah, and the connect the number that I came up with four point seven. Ew, that's terrible. You're yeah. supposed to be getting two hundred. That's what I thought. I only yeah. got it throughout. So oh, fast, wonderful. which is at fast dot com, is run by Netflix, and what it is is how fast is your connection to Netflix? Uh, on your phone, it's going to be slower than two hundred. Two hundreds if you're direct connected to the spectrum modem you know your computer has a as a wire coming out of it going into the spectrum modem so so your phone is going to be a little slower but that is awfully slow in fact i if if that's the speed are you doing zoom on your phone or are you doing it on your computer no on my laptop on your laptop you can do this do the do the fast on your laptop too uh, to see how fast it is. So part of that is phones, sometimes phones, Wi-Fi radios aren't as good as the laptop. I always get faster speeds on my laptop than I do on my phone just because it's got a better uh, Wi-Fi card in it. So that's the first thing to do. You know, I understand why you went around the house because you're trying to see if there's dead spots in the house. And it's going to be fastest when you're closest to your, your Wi-Fi uh, access point. Right, you know where you know where that is, right? That's by the spectrum box, probably. I'm next to the router. Yep. So that's yeah. going to be your fastest speed. What does the phone say when you're right next to that? I did it with the phone, and it still said four point seven. That's terrible. How about with your laptop? Have you tried it with your laptop? No, I haven't. But what I did to test it out, I put the laptop across from the router. That'll give you your best results, yeah. Yeah, I went ahead. I went ahead and talked to my friend through Zoom. We did it for half an hour, and there was no problem. Okay, so it works well when you're next to it. It's just when you get farther away from it. Yeah, because what happened is that I had my. I'm in the back room, and my that's where my laptop is. And from my room to the router, it's about a hundred feet. Yeah, there's your problem. I yeah, I yeah. tried that, and the connect, and then it says your band bandwidth is unstable. Yeah, so the farther you get, especially if there's walls or doors in between, and depends yeah. what those walls are made of. If there's some metal in them, there then it really will be bad. So Wi-Fi at its best from your router if there's nothing in between you and the router it goes about 150 feet so you're really at the edge of of what can what can work on that router yeah. so there's a couple of things you can do uh you you're using the router spectrum gave you yes yeah so you don't have to use their router uh -huh. you, you can get go out and get a router uh from a company called eero it's an amazon company e-e-r-o these are not inexpensive they're expensive, Daisy, a few hundred dollars. But it, but you, what you'll do is you'll put it where the spectrum router is, and then you'll have that's the base station, and then you can put some Eros, what they call the beacons, 
And I would get two, one halfway to your room and one in your room. And what happens is they act to hand, with handoffs to get it all the way down to your room so that you get better speed. A good, oh, a good, a good router will really improve that. E E R O dot com, or you can get them on Amazon because that's that's who owns them. How much do they cost? Well, that's the negative. Um, I think you're going to be spending probably three hundred bucks. Is that out of your out of your price range? Yeah, it is. Would it be better to use like an Ethernet cable? Yes, <laughs> if you could do a cable. If you don't mind having a cable going down that hall, that's the best of all. That'd be better than any Wi-Fi. But because I was looking at also at a Wi-Fi booster, are those things really good or no? No, that's why I say Eero instead of a Wi-Fi booster. There's okay. another thing you can do that's uh, that would also probably work. It's called power line networking, and it uses the electrical wiring in your house instead of an Ethernet cable. It's not as fast as Ethernet, but it would probably be faster. In fact, I know it would be faster than your Wi-Fi. The company that I recommend for these is called TP-Link. And again, you can look at Amazon, and you can... Yeah, yeah, TP-Link's good. If you search for power line networking on Amazon or, uh, you know, at tplink.com, it's tp link. Uh, uh -huh. com. You can get, you'll need two. You'll need one that plugs in next to your spectrum modem and then one that plugs in down the hall in your room. And as long as that's all one electrical system, it'll be fine. If there are, if there are junction boxes, fuse boxes in between you, uh, your room and the, where the router is, that will get in the way. But most houses, you have one fuse box and everything's on the same, uh, wiring. It actually uses the wiring in your house. So you, the way this works is kind of wild. It plugs in to the plug socket. Uh, and then an Ethernet cable goes from your router into that. And then you plug another one into your plug socket in your room. And that cable, or you can actually get them with Wi-Fi, it would work fine. So now you've got Wi-Fi in your room that's connected all the way down the hall using the electrical wiring. And that actually works pretty well. It's not going to be 200 megabits, but it'll be 100 megabits. It'll be a lot faster, and it'll certainly be all right for Zoom. The other thing you can try before you do all this, 100 feet is a long way, so that's my biggest concern. But before you do all this, another thing you can try is positioning the, the Wi-Fi access point. You know, the thing with antennas. Put it high up because it turns out humans are as bad as walls. In fact, we're worse. We're giant bags of water from the point of view of a Wi-Fi router, and that will just, if as soon as it hits your body, it kills the signal. So if there's people walking around, that's bad. So you, so always you want to put the Wi-Fi router, the thing with antennas, as high as you can. That'll help get it down the hall. You could try a Wi-Fi extender. My experience with them is that they cut the signal in half because they spend half the time talking to you and half the time talking to the router. So that's not ideal. Uh, that's one of the reasons we talk about things like the Eero. But a, but a lower cost solution, under 100 bucks, uh, and, and I think a really good solution for a lot of households is what we call power line networking. Used to be terrible. Uh, a lot of times you ask a geek about it and they go, oh no, don't do that. That's horrible. But they've gotten so, they're not, it's not, this is not your grandfather's power line networking. They, they've really gotten a, a heck of a lot better than they used to be. It was nice talking to you. I hope I hope it all works uh, works out. Cause yeah, you know you want to be able to do your Zoom calls. For, for a lot of us, it's our only connection to the outside world these days. Well, hey hey hey, how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got your smartphones. We've got your smartwatches. We've got all of that jazz. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. You want to talk high tech with me? 888 827 5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the uh, U.S. or Canada. Chuck is on the line from uh, Southern Tennessee. Hello, Chuck. Hi. How you doing, Leo? I'm well. How are you? Oh, I'm sleepy right now, waiting to come online. Well, did you take you can take a little nap when we're putting you on hold. That's okay. That's a good idea. No, that's no, that's all right. Uh, I do remember once picking up on hold and uh, somebody was snoring. Well, no, no, I'm not sore. I've been 
listen to you since uh, uh, the what the ZDTV days. Oh well, that's nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. that. Was that was nineteen ninety eight. And uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a technical writer, retired now, but I'm still doing some writing. And nice. this new Word 316, all the improvements to it has made it almost unusable. Uh. So uh, what I need is a good something as good as the Windows 10 field guide. Is there any such thing for uh, uh, Windows Word 316? So. Um you're talking about my good friend Paul Thorat's excellent book on uh, Windows 10, the field guide to Windows right. 10. I don't know what good books there are on Microsoft Word. Um, you, so you've used Word for all this time for your work and so forth, but you found it difficult to use the newer version? Uh, I've, got, I've got the latest version of it on my on my computer. Yeah, uh, I've been a I've been a technical writer now for over sixty years. So you're you're saying when you sit down at uh, Word from Office three sixty five, right? And you look at it, you it, you can't figure it out. Oh, I can do the Roy just fine. But oh, there's little things in there like a. The other day, I had a heck of a time trying to save a file to a USB drive. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, 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 they've done made changes, and there's no. There's yeah, no, you know, and there's really no reason to make changes because honestly, I think word processors and how they work were solved many, many moons ago. There's not, there's nothing, there's nothing, uh, you, you know, nothing you need to really improve much. The writing, you know, yeah, I need to be able to. I just can't have trouble using it. I wonder. If, I'm. I'm wondering if anybody made as good a manual as the one that's yeah. got. I. Got. I do not know, uh, particularly, um, if, but there is one that might be the the one that you want called the Writer's Guide to Microsoft Word. Okay, I'll, I'll look that up. I that's focused on writing specifically, because a lot of what's happened with with all of the Office tools is they've turned more into tools, <laughs> power I tools. I, I wish they quit improving. I know they don't need to improve it. We figured out how to do this. No, I've been using it for sixty years. So what do you what are you writing these days? Well, I'm a technical writer in the aerospace world. Oh, interesting. If you want to see one of them, you can Google S-E-D-R-109. So you have specific requirements for layout and things like that. Oh, Mercury. Oh, this is the Mercury sorry, Flight man. Operations Manual. You wrote that, huh? Flag, wow. Capsule Flight Operations Manual. Wow. I wrote that about 60 years ago. Holy moly. Was that for John Glenn? Oh no! Yeah, he used it, but I, I yeah, I, actually, I, I work. I wrote the first manuals. I'm sure the Air Force moved it after I rewrote it after I moved on. But the, what you see on there is, if you giggle, if you, I'm me, reading it. I'm looking at it. Yeah. If you go far enough in, you can read the whole text. This Everything is for this is for manual. Capsule Seven, right? Fr yeah, well, the, that, that was Friendship that was Seven. Time. It was the first rest zone. It's not. Uh, oh wow! It was I can't. Uh, my name says me. You know, uh, the very first launch. Wow! Uh, they uh, I, they won. It was. Uh, so that was uh, Shepard. Uh, that was Alan Shepard's uh, vehicle. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I watched. I, I met Alan Shepard. Came to my desk to talk about the. Uh, Holy cow, <laughs> sir! It is an honor to meet you. Wow! Uh, not, not, not me. I was just a I was just a technical writer trying to make enough money to go back and finish college. <laughs> I, was for a, I was working as a writing pilot's handbooks for a McDonnell Aircraft. So, so the Mercury Redstone Three, which was the which was Friendship Seven, is that right? Uh, I can't. Yeah, yeah I think it was. I think that's that was the the phrase we used that's been, for it. That's been, a long, that's been a long time ago. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, but that was, a, of course, a legendary flight, and you you uh, wrote the flight manual for the capsule operations. Now, I remember, uh, I remember, I don't know if it was Alan Shepard or John Glenn who said it, that were just spamming a can, that they were, they were accomplished pilots, and they wanted more control of the capsule. Isn't that right? 
Oh yes, uh, the biggest the biggest thing uh, the capsule main thing it was find out is just how much could the astronaut do? Uh, you know the Russian astronaut where they stuck a guy in there and shot him up and let him back down. <laughs> he couldn't do anything. He had no controls. And I remember it was the early Mercury astronauts who said, no, you're giving us controls. We're not going up in a can unless you give us some controls on there. So that's what the manual was, right? The manual yeah, those for those controls? I only, yeah, I wrote that. Uh, set, we sat up there and says, what if, and, you know, just check, uh, what if this switch doesn't work? Can you find another way of doing it? Wow. See, this is what we I, we did all this uh, a year before the first flight. And I'm thinking you weren't using Microsoft Word to write that thing. No, I, I was writing it by hand and giving it. I had a secretary type it. Wait up. a minute, you were writing it with a with a pencil, and then somebody typed it up. Right. <laughs> I mean, man, you could talk forever about the good old days, you know. Oh, Chuck, I am. Uh, it's an honor to meet you. I hope somebody is is talking to you and writing this all down. I'd love to, love to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to write a book, but I'm I'm not having much success. That's why I'm get, trying to get my uh, in the current version of Word. I, yeah, I don't know if, if Word is probably more than you really want for something like this. Uh, but I've been using it since. Uh, for 25 years. Yeah. That's what gets me, yeah. is they've made it hard for you to use. Of all people. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, I'm glad to talk to you. Uh, I could talk, we could talk for hours on this subject. I wish I had the time to talk for hours with you, because uh, it's certainly an honor to meet you, sir. Yeah, I'm and, retired now, and I'm just, and I, and I, and handicapped to a wheelchair, so I just stick in my office and try to write up the good old days. Oh, I hope you do, because I think uh, there'd be a lot of people who would love love to read that, Chuck. Uh, wow. So everybody, if you, I'll put a link in the show notes to SEDR109, right? Right, and that's it. That's, uh, I also wrote another one, but I've never found a copy of it online. I wrote t two manuals, one of them for the... Uh, capsule and one for the a simulator or the trainer. Wow. Wow. It was a SEDR 114. Wow. That stands for Service Engineering Department Report. <laughs> now, you're writing it in pencil. Um, are you looking, what are you looking at as you're writing it? I mean, how do you, this is a year before they built the darn thing, right? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, we had the wiring diagrams and the frame, and I used to sit and, uh, hey, uh, I'll try to. Say, I wrote up an article about Mercury memories. It's, I, it's it's work in progress, but if you'd like to have it, I'll email it to you. Well, here's no, that's not necessary. Well, you can, but what I'd love to do is, uh, when you finish that and and you get that thing published, and I'm sure you will. Um, I hope you will um, call me back and we can get everybody to buy a copy of it. Because Oh, I, I write so slow. I've been writing on that <laughs> thing for uh, 60 years. Uh, wow. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, SEDR 109 manual. The Meadville Space Center has uh, uh, kindly uploaded that to the Internet. I'm, I'm, I intend to put the, my... Uh, my uh, Trainer, a slink trainer manual. Give it to them. I don't know if anybody's got a copy of that one. If that you was... have the, if you have the print manual, I'm sure we can find somebody who will uh, scan that in. Because this is a scan too of a of a printed manual. This is not no, obviously. No, it's not a printed manual. The one I got, uh, I was the last thing before I re got out, left McDonnell Aircraft. Uh, I've got a copy of the. Uh, manual as well it was just before it went to print it was in uh, xerox or something whatever we we're using for right a copy. right right but i'm going to have a i'm going to have, i give that to my son-in-law but he's going to make me a photocopy of that so before it fades out completely please do let's let's save that because wow you have formal procedures emergency procedures and troubleshooting well, yeah. Well, well, that was used in conjunction with the maintenance manual, which is a very detailed description of all of the systems. You know. Wow. This was, this was really more for training the uh, ground crew, the tracker crews that work in the stations around the world. Because they're communicating with the uh, the astronauts or the astronaut, right. 
And so they need to know what the astronaut's looking at, right? Right. Uh, and uh, it was used with a simulator, for like a link trainer. Yeah. And uh, we uh, they trained the uh, ground crews along with them. Uh, their first title, the original title for this was the Astronaut's Handbook. <laughs> And the uh, last review, NASA reviewed it, and the last change they made in it was change the title for, to the service engineering. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. You know, At, uh, <laughs> that's a little more formal, isn't it? <laughs> right. And also, it's, it was used for more than the astronauts. It was for training everybody in conjunction that's with awesome. uh, that would co be communicating with them in flight. What a piece of history this is. This is the, the first space capsule to go, uh, uh -huh. to go into a, our first manned flight. I thought you'd. I thought you'd enjoy it. I, I do, and it would, it, I hope somebody at Microsoft's listening. Here's a guy who wrote the manual for the first space capsule to go into manned flight, and he can't figure out how to lose the latest version of Word, folks. Can we make this a little easier? I don't know how much longer I'll be here to talk to anybody because I'm the same age as your mother. Oh, Chuck, you're hanging in there. Please do, okay? And you're obviously... I'm still, I'm still writing. It's just mental exercise now. That's good exercise, and you're doing to, it for... I'll try, to finish, I'll try to finish my book, my writings on that. I'll, I'll, well, I'll write as long as I live. But, e email uh, it to leo at techguylabs.com. I'd love to see what you got so far. And I'll email okay. you back. I, I may, I, it, it, okay, email or... I, Email's fine. Leo at techguylabs.com. Okay, I'll send you a copy. Uh, Bless you, Chuck. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your service, for what you did. I think that you were in college, huh? Yeah, I had a ball with it, doing it. I didn't know what I was doing, you know. I was just... Uh, all I had was two years of college, and I <laughs> came out of the Air Force and uh, write pilot's handbooks, and then they I wound up over in Project Mercury. Wow. Wow. And you, you never know where it's going to happen. The guy, my boss one day asked me, he says, I got a temporary program. Uh, uh, would you like to go? And I said, sure. And then I, that's before <laughs> I found out what it was. <laughs> well, Sir, thank you for all you've done. You're a piece of history. You have a part of history now. That's a big deal. Well, I've enjoyed it. I've had a, I've had a good life all the way up. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. A pleasure to meet you, Chuck. Try that uh, Microsoft Word for Writers book. I think that might be a little bit uh, better for doing what you're doing. Although I have to say, Windows comes with something called WordPad. That is really just a simple version of Word. I bet it would do everything you want it to do. I, I don't. I, well, what I need is how to handle it. Uh, the uh, uh, I, maybe I need more of a one for Windows 10. You know, uh, right? Like I had a problem running, making that, copying it to uh, USB. It wouldn't go like it did. Right. I finally got it done, but it wasn't easy. So I guess I may have. I'm. Lots of times I have to write my own checklist, uh, you know, step one, step two, That's right. step three. That's right. Like I did back in, in the beginning. It's just like a manual for the Mercury flight capsule. You just go, right. to, just one, put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> Holy yeah. cow. Uh, it is an honor to meet you. Thank you so much for calling, Chuck. I really appreciate it. I look forward to reading your manuscript. And you call okay. back because we want to talk some more about the good old days. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hey, it's a pleasure talking to you. I don't know if I helped you much, but wow. It's cool that this is online. I mean, it's clearly a, a scan. It's a PDF. We'll put a link in the show notes. During launch, the obturation of the capsule is completely automatic, wrote Chuck. Therefore, the only action required will be to monitor all instruments and warning lights to guard against a malfunction of some component. Closely monitor the abort light. If it illuminates... Verify with ground station and on their command, activate a board handle. If the elapsed time and retrograde time go to go, clocks fail to start at launch, depress the time zero button. <laughs> Replace the time zero button cap after launch. Check that the jet tower telelight illuminates green approximately 20 seconds after the booster engines shut off. <laughs> And the SEP capsule telelight illuminates green approximately two seconds after the sustainer engine shuts off. I'll be sure to do that. Orbit. The orbit checklist should be completed as soon as possible after obtaining orbit. 
<laughs> wow, Chuck, you're a legend. This is amazing. You're a good writer, too. Oh, I, well, that was just a matter of uh, doing it step by step. What happens if I flip this switch and then write? What happens if it doesn't? Yeah. Wow. Now, do you do you feel like uh, Alan got it and and memorized this and had it all in his head? They did a lot of simulation, didn't they? Oh yes, but also this was uh, I'm sure uh, NASA did uh, completely. You know, they had a complete plan for the mission, but this was a training manual for use with a simulator and for training the ground crew. Right. Right. They, uh, it was still contained all the procedures. Um, and NASA had other stuff put in there for the task. See, this was this book was written a year before the first flight. Right. They probably didn't even have a capsule yet. It was. It had to be completed when we submitted the uh, trainer for getting to the. Uh, you know, when we submitted it, it went with the uh, simulator. Wow. It, I had to have it finished when they shipped the simulator. This is incredible, oh. yeah. Here I am standing. So where did you get the information that you're writing up here? I mean... Oh, well, I talked to the engineer who designed the systems. So he would tell you all this, and you're taking notes. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's right funny. I, I would... Uh, you would, Some engineers would really help you. Some wouldn't. And so uh, some of them I'd write up something, send it to them, review, for them to review and approve, and they didn't... They would... If they wouldn't talk to me about it, they would spend a day or two uh, correcting my write-up. <laughs> yeah, I note, I note that in this manual, there's a lot of room for notes. There's well, oh, oh, yeah. I look at the look at the, if you got the manual the way it was laid out on page one page was the text and the opposite right. page was the checklist. Right. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. I wish more people would do like that. It would give you a chance to. Uh, uh, well, these all these manuals I've got, the information is there, but there's no checklist. That's really a good point. So you're reading prose on the left, but on the right is step one, step two, step three, step four. Our, we we had a long conversation. Also, we made that capsule uh, manual small enough to stick in the flying suit pocket. Well, you weren't going to carry an a book, carry a plane, yeah, but yeah, you could, wear, you could wear it in a simulator. Wow. I used to sit in the mock-up and review the product. I was I was going to say, you'd have to get in, too, wouldn't you? Make oh, sure yeah. it all works. I would, I would get up and set in the uh, uh, simulator, and uh, I had a dream. I had a, a, a couple times I'd, I'd, I'd go to sleep. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd take a nap in the, the, the mock-up. Chuck, i got to run. I'm sorry to say, but I will talk to you again soon, I hope. Wow. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo. Wow. Wow. Really fun to talk to Chuck. It really says something, too, that this guy... Why is why do they keep changing word every five minutes? You know why? It's the same reason they put fins on Cadillacs, just so it looks different. So you say, well, I must have to get the new one. Got to have the new one. There's, word pro There's no reason to change a word processor. We know exactly what it needs to do. <laughs> it's as if, you know, the, every Mercury capsule is just a little bit different than the one before. Well, that's the new one. I wonder, did they probably didn't change those, right? You, that's why you keep the steering wheel on the left and the gas pedal on the right, and that's just the way it should be. But not with word, no. And in fact, I think the thing that really probably threw Chuck, certainly threw a lot of us, was when they went to that new ribbon Interface and the idea was there were so many commands in Microsoft's Office products, but particularly in Word. Microsoft realized the people only used five percent of them. A lot of it was because they just didn't know the, that they could do that because it was all hidden away in menus. So they said, "How can we get people to use more of the features we build into our Word processor?" They created that ribbon because now now it takes up a lot of space, but you can see more of the commands. You don't have to go into the menus, you know, dig deep to find a command. And I'm sure, I don't know about you, but when I work with software, I, I'm not spending a lot of time in the menus looking for a command. If it doesn't, if I don't know it, I don't do it. 
but they want you to do that stuff. So now they have this ribbon, which takes up a large chunk of the screen up at the top there with a lot of pictures and commands in there. And that's all because, you know, they, in their research, they saw, oh, people aren't using it. But why not? <laughs> if they're not using it, do they need it? Uh, 8888 Ask Leo. The Gizwiz coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now, here's how you get out. Once you, once you land, the normal egress. Now, probably Gus Grissom went, didn't do exactly what was on this list because he lost the capsule, right? Eject reserve chute by placing rescue switch to manual. Visually inspect capsule for water leaks. I bet you Gus missed that one. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, remove restraint harness and verify... The biomed cable, face piece seal line, blood pressure cuff hose, and oxygen uh, outlet hose are disconnected because it's going to be hard to get out if you don't. And that the face piece seal is deflated. Detached survival kit from capsule. You're going to want that. Verify survival kit. Lanyard is attached to suit. Disconnect helmet from suit and adjust neck dam. Note, leave helmet on to maintain communications and for protection against explosive hatch pressure wave. Yikes. Perform post-impact checklist if time permits, if you're not sinking. Remember, you're in the ocean. Here comes the helicopter. I like the pictures. Verify by radio contact the helicopter is hooked to capsule and is ready for astronaut egress. Disconnect suit inlet hose, lock inlet receptacle cap, detach communications cable, turn ammeter switch to off. You know, you've got to remember all of these things. That's, you know, it's good they have a checklist. Remove hatch indicator initiator lap cap. Remove hatch indicator. Initiator cap, pull safety pin, and strike... Oh, this is the explosive bolts. Strike ignitor plunger. Caution. Do not remove cap and safety pin until ready for hatch release. Remove helmet if desired and egress with survival kit into helicopter hoist. The end. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Lady Laura, give me a little... Little dig here. 80, 88, 88, ask Leo. That's my theme song. Mark in Cerritos, California is next. Hello, Mark. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. I'm a longtime listener and a first-time caller. Welcome. It's nice to um, talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I recently, I'm probably the last guy uh, on the planet to upgrade from uh, Windows 7 to Windows 10. I bought a new computer recently and got that up and running, and and it inspired me to take uh, some of my old analog videos and digitize them and save them on my computer before the tapes degraded. Good thinking. Thank you. And I, I use an Elgato video capture device that I bought from Amazon, and yep. it seemed to work pretty well. And I got the, the raw video onto the computer. There's no editing on that software. Right. So I, so my first question for you is I need some video editing software so I can cut out, you know, when I left the camera on and I got five minutes of my feet. <laughs> how many times have i shot the ground moving below the camera and my exactly. feet going in and out oh i've done that too exactly so i need i need some uh video editing software uh it needs to be very intuitive easy to use and cheap so don't feel too left out it's estimated there are around 200 million people still running windows 7 out there so you're not you're not late to the game, uh, although Windows 10 has taken off uh, at a pretty rapid clip, probably because they gave it away or continue to give it away to Windows 7 users. They really want you to move. But one of the things you probably noticed is you've lost Windows Movie Maker, which wasn't the best program ever, but it was a program that came with Windows for doing for taking out shots of your feet. Right now, what format when you uh, when you uh, ripped it? What format are the videos in now? Well, uh, based on what I'm reading on the box, it, it, it transfers it to uh, 
uh, some sort of format that I'm not familiar with. But then when you're all done, it converts it to MP4. Good. All right. So that's a very common format. And there's and almost any video editing program uh, will edit that. And, uh, you know, uh, it depends how much you want to spend. If you want something that's really capable and good and under $100, I'm going to recommend Adobe's Premier Elements. Okay. That is the, you know, they make the Elements version of their big boy apps. Um, Premier is a professional video editor that's widely used. In fact, we use it for uh, all of our videos um, on our podcast network. But Elements is a simpler version of it that's inexpensive, and it does almost everything you want, including at some point if you wanted to burn those to a DVD and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so it'll, it'll let you cut out the feet, and it will let you uh, do more with it, a lot more with it. I think that's a good... Is it easy to use? Yeah. It's very sophisticated. Yeah. Uh, I've never done video editing, so I need something. It needs to be a beginner's level kind of a product. So there's an, it's this is an interesting category because all the professional tools do something called timeline editing. That's kind of how, you know, video editing is done. And the way it, it looks on your window is you have a... A video clips and you can see kind of frames of the video and then you have a playback window and you have an effects window and you can assemble the clips you can cut them almost as if you're f like cutting them with a razor blade or scissors like in the old days except you're doing it with a digital tool it's kind of is an a is a digital representation of what we used to do in the analog days and that timeline editing is very common and generally i tell people if you're going to use an editing tool use a timeline editor there are other editors that don't do it that way but the problem is if you ever then want to get you know go to the next level you're going to have to learn timeline editing anyway at some point um i think premiere elements uses timeline i don't think it's too hard to figure out if you ever used windows movie maker or any a variety of things apple's iMovie um, you're familiar with that. So, I've never used a video editor at all. Yeah. Well, so if you think I'm never going to need to do anything more than I want to do, like clip out the feet, you, there actually is a tool built into Windows 10 in the Photos app. It's not a timeline editor, but it'll let you cut out things. Uh, trim it and snip out stuff. You can even uh, trim is the trim is the part that f the uh, feature you want. It's to trim out your feet, basically. Um, right, right. So that's there. It's all in the. It's all. It's actually in the in the. Uh, uh, let's see how you how you. It's. Uh, what do I search for? To yeah. Find that? It. Uh, it's it's part of the photos app. So if you open uh, photos, uh, then open your video file. In photos, actually, you could just right click on the video file and select open with and then open with photos we will open it up in the photos app. And then you'll see right there on the screen a picture of your video, the play button, you can play it. But there's also an edit button, I think it's edit and create that will let you once you click that trim it. And then you can cut. So this is the simplest way to do it. It's not timeline editing, it's not going to kind of lead you to the next level in editing but it but if all you want to do is cut out little bits that's probably all you need and you already have that and then you okay. just save it so it's weird because microsoft puts it in the photos tool but actually many of the things that you would want to do with simple video editing are there including you could add music you know you can trim out stuff you don't like and save it out if at some point you want to get more fancy then i would get premiere elements uh it's about a, a, under 100 bucks about 70 or 80 bucks on on sale and you can learn it but you're right you, if you if all you want to do is <laughs> is simple little trimming things that'll work just fine great and and this has inspired me to also uh, uh go forward i've got a bunch of 35 millimeter slides that I need to digitize. You want to do the same thing. They're not going to degrade as fast as that video would, but still they are, you know, they're aging. Uh, so I need a slide scanner. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. So this is a painful process. Uh, there are inexp many, many, Epson makes a bunch of uh, very nice scanners that have holders for slides. You can do a half a dozen at a time. 
And you need a, for a slide scanner, it's opposite of what you're doing when you're scanning uh, paper documents. Pa paper documents, you're bouncing light off of them into the camera. With a slide, you're shining light right through the slide. So there needs to be a light right. in the lid, right? But but Epson makes a variety of these photo sc or slide scanners. They're not slide scanners. They're regular scanners with the capability of doing slides. That's the least expensive way to do it. Companies like Nikon make actual slide scanners, but they're going to be a thousand bucks. And you, yeah, that's out of the. That's out yeah, of the, you don't want to spend that kind of money. And you just feed the slide. And how many are? Is it a ton of them? Oh, I've probably got maybe a thousand or two thousand. Yikes! Slides, if like you that. can pare it down, it would probably behoove you to send it to a service bureau where they'll do a nice job. That's what we did with ours. We had a bunch of you know Kodak carousels. We just we right. took them out. We we didn't even clean them up. We just sent them in a box. Uh, they they scan them. They clean it up. And they send it back to you uh, on a CD or a DVD. Probably nowadays they just put it online. That's going to save you a lot of time. But if you're in the mood, get an Epson Perfection scanner and you can scan the photos. It does a very good job. And it's fairly easy. It's just that it's slow. Right. If you have thousands uh, to scan and, and you're scanning... I probably won't scan them all. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll pick out the ones I want to keep in, in vacations or something and scan those. Because some of them aren't... Yeah. Kodak makes, and I don't know how good it is, something called the Scanza, and it's okay. cheap. But the way it works is kind of is a little funky. But it might be worth looking at. I've talked to people who've used it, um, and it it might be worth looking at. It's not expensive; it's a couple hundred bucks. Actually, it's less, and it will scan thirty five millimeter Super Eight film, that kind of thing, and convert it to dig digital. So Can that, you recommend a, uh, hang, hang on just a second, I gotta take a break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, the Gizwiz coming up. So I haven't tried the Scanza, but I have had people call and say that's pretty cool. So okay, uh, I'll give it a look. Uh, let me recommend a, a software for the previous caller that the, the NASA technical writer. Yeah, he was great. Uh, he was a great guest. Wasn't that interesting? Uh, yeah. Yes, very interesting. Uh, you know, I use, I'm, again, I'm not a power user, but I use Neat Office, and it's pretty simple. It's got Word, a Word equivalent, an Excel equivalent, and they're really easy to use. They're like the old versions of Word. And it's free. Versions of Excel. And it's free. Wow. So maybe maybe you can recommend that to him. I, that's what I've been using on this new computer, and it does everything I want to do with it, and it sounds like it would meet the needs of your uh, of your caller. It's, it, and it comes from uh, Microsoft? Yeah, no. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. I'm not I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to take a look at that. It's called Neat Office. Yeah. And it's got it's it, it's got three three programs. It's got a word equivalent and an Excel equivalent, and a, um, uh, oh, what's the one for making your... PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, it's got a PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep, yep. Huh. I haven't used the PowerPoint, but I use the Excel and the Word all the time, and they work great, and they're simple. It isn't for Microsoft, but it is in the store. It's from any DVD and Office app. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I think if it's the same people did any DVD, that was, it's a nice little company. I, I'm downloading it right now. I'm going to check it out. Neat Office. Yeah. It's in the uh, Microsoft App Store. And yeah, anything simple would probably be a better choice for him, right? Something just yeah, basic. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and it's free. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a quick download. It's not sophisticated. Very simple interface. And uh, again, I, I found that it does everything that I want. Nice. To and you can save... You can you can save the docu documents in multiple uh, different formats. You can use their format, which I think they call it ODF, but you can save it in in Excel. You know, ninety three. Okay. So it'll go in doc uh, doc format. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can save it. There, there's about a dozen different formats you can save these things in. So. Well, I've just installed it. Compatible. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Great recommendation. You're welcome. And thank you. I hope I hope you can pass that on to him. Uh, yeah, that guy was great. Wasn't he amazing? Yeah, if you get a chance, look up this manual. It's hysterical. This this yeah. amazing I will thing. Do that. I, I will S do that. SEDR 109. Hey, pleasure talking okay. to you. Thank you, Leo. All right, Mark. Likewise. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, Dickie D. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I am well. How are you? I'm good, too. Thank you. Good, good, good. We're going to do three uh, post show. I got to do hands on tech and two hands on Max. So, oh, okay. but I'm going to move quickly. So we'll probably be done by three.
Six o'clock uh, time. Uh, okay. For a okay. Giz Viz P. You know, when uh, when uh, six, when sixty minutes was on CBS, it was something I had arranged. I'd written them many times. Bill called me and he said, This is the best thing that ever happened to Mad. I'll buy you whatever you want. And I said, Okay, I think I don't know what he's talking about. I said, Okay, I'll take a boat. <laughs> and he goes, How much is that? I said, Twenty thousand. He goes, Think little. <laughs> I said, Bill, are, are you serious? And he said, of course I'm serious. I said, can I have a real computer? And he goes, yeah. Nice. How much is how much is that? I said, about 3000 He said, okay, uh, buy something. Don't cheat yourself. Don't spend more than 4500 wow. Anyway, Leo, Word, do you know how much Word was how much? back then? How much? $500. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Five, yes. Yeah. And so I installed it. And I click Control S Save. Yeah, a menu comes up. <laughs> Which department <laughs> should be allowed? I, 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 this is thank you, Microsoft. Ways, you know, you're, yeah, for you know, overcomplicating the simplest. Oh my God! As soon as the left retro rocket fires, and before, in all caps, five seconds elapses. The retro fire sequence must be interrupted by means of the squib switch as indicated above. Oh, Leo, well, tell us something we don't know. <laughs> I was just working on my own book. Make sure the mirrored ball is spinning before the red, green, and yellow light. We need a is disco boat on. simulator. That's what we need. That's Dick D. Bartolo, our disco god. He is also Mad Magazine's maddest writer for 50 plus years. He's also our very own gizmo wizard. We call him. A giz whiz. Hello, Dickie D. Leo, how you doing? I, I'm doing great. Wasn't that fun? Talking oh, about that was great. That, the, that, that's the, amazing. Friendship 7, the Mercury capsules. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, Dick joins us every week to share a gizmo or a gadget or something. Okay, now I, I, I'm worried that you're going to think this is not great, but I think it's a great idea. You okay? take it personally, so, don't you? If I say... Oh, oh, that's yes. not great. You, you oh, yes. that hurts no, you. My cri my criteria is Leo likes it. That's one star. <laughs> Leo buys it. That's two stars. <laughs> Leo buys multiple three <laughs> three stars. And nothing ever gets four stars. And nothing ever gets. No. Well, if Lisa comes in and says, "Get me one too." That's, that's four, four stars. stars. You that's bet. You stars, bet. Right. Then we got a winner. Oh. And actually, oh, okay. the last time that happened was with those nice little uh, lights with the clip. So oh, they're great. They yeah, I was just I yes. just bought another one yesterday because it was Black Friday and they were twelve dollars. That's me. Um, uh, stop! Okay. Stop! So, Don't tell me that. Don't tell me okay. that. Okay. Okay. I already this have is, twelve uh, of them. <laughs> 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 this is a kit called Snap Style Design and Print Your Own Mask Kit. Okay, so okay. this is, all right, so you take your camera, take a picture of yourself. You mean, well, makes, wait a minute. Wait a minute, makes yeah. a mask of you? Uh, no, it can be. Oh, it's you a want. it's a it's a COVID mask a with COVID your face mask. on it. Now, here's the question: Is it full face recognition software? You know what? It is. If you do every step, it meets who requirements. It's either the World Health Organization Ooh. Ooh. or Wally's Hamburger <laughs> Outlet. I'm not, I'm, so wait, wait, wait. This I'm, is hysterical. Obviously, they print it, right? No, Leo. I expected. Them to send me to say send us a photograph, right? And we'll print this it. This kit, this kit shows up in the mail with that mask. They must have got it from my website, and and made it. So they send you four sheets of printable cotton. Oh my goodness! So it's a it's a World Health Organization approved mask that has nothing well, it on meet, it. it. It meets the requirements of them. Okay? okay, so you get four printable cotton panels, you get four filter inserts, you get the aluminum nose bridge straps, <laughs> you get get elastic ear loops so that you can make them for kids or for adults, and you can see like, all right, this is a this is a one star now. Uh yeah, this could go to you, two or even three. Three stars pretty quick here. You, this is good. You can put anything you want on it. Wait a minute. So but uh, when you print this on the printer, then what? 
So then you peel the the cotton part off. All right. Yeah. Uh, if you go to their website and, and, and click on learn, there's a whole. I when I got done with the steps involved in this, I thought, thank God they made me one. <laughs> uh, it, it is a lot. All yeah, right. And yeah. it's a little like the fold in when you make the folds <laughs> on the mask. It's put, you know, A against B. Oh, and yeah, press because this is it. one of those yeah. masks that has vent, you know, the folds in it yes. the pleats in it so you have to print it with the pleats and then fold yes. it together oh wow and then so you so you need the kit you need a printer and you need an iron okay <laughs> oh it's a it's an and iron on yes because all the adhesive strips are heat activated uh strips oh. i mean they really did a heck of a job designing this. And I then, get it. So these strips then go on to the mask where the pleats are. I get it. I get it. Exactly. Yeah. And the little folds tell you that to match A with A and B with B. Oh, and you can even see it uh, virtually in your phone. You can, yes. When you first take the photo, you can see what it will look like on you. And then I thought, well, the next thing is going to be, I'm going to go online and find out this is some ridiculous uh, price. It is four of them. For eighteen dollars, oh, so not bad it's, at all. It's not much no, more than no. a regular mask. No, absolutely. And if you are interested in this, don't buy the the two pack is sixteen dollars. The four pack is eighteen dollars. Get all four. Yeah. Yeah. Get all four. And as you uh, watch the video, you'll see that it's complicated, but they cover all the bases. You know, I've been Field sewing movement. my own masks by hand. This is not more complicated than that. It's a lot easier than Oh, that. no, no, not at all. Yeah. Oh, you were sewing by hand? Oh, yeah, but that's kind of oh, fun. It was a little project. Yeah, I haven't, yeah. I haven't done it lately but because uh, I made plenty of masks, but it was kind of, I think it was a way of handling my anxiety. You know, you make oh, your okay, own mask, okay. then you feel like, well, I'm doing something. Oh, okay, this, well, that's this a good takes, idea. You're going to need an iron. You're going to need an iron, and you're going to need some you know, it's crafty. It, it's exactly right. And you match the A to, you know, it is like a fold-in with the uh, yeah. match the A yeah, to yeah. B, except with the fold-in, you don't iron it. But this is exactly what you do when you make your own mask. And that's optional, by the way, but, I, but I've done this. So that's okay, really cool. Good. And it comes with a bunch of adhesive tape and stuff so you can... Oh, everything you need. And then the loops, you put the loop on one side, try it on, and then you know where to cut the string for the loop can on the other side. Can you wash it? I don't think so. I believe they are uh, a certain number of hours, and then you should just make another one or wear another one. So you one. will not, want to get four. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. Because you're going to exactly. go through them. Exactly. But this is great if you're going to a party or something. You'll be have really something to uh, people yeah, to talk about. Yeah, there you go. It's for a special occasion. Uh, yeah. Have a mask that matches your face or your dress or your puppy. Yeah. If you're a leopard, it matches the one that they if do in the leopard, demo tape. If you're a leopard, your spots can match. Yep. <laughs> wow. And so really what it is is you you are, in effect, making sewing your mask because it uses adhesive instead of stitches. To do exactly. Oh, that's, that's really exactly. interesting. Huh. Yeah. Wow. And, where and well, this I was going to say where to get it. I know where you get it. You go to Dick's website. That's where you get it. G-I-Z dot. Uh, I'm sorry. No dot there. G-I-Z-W-I-Z, -I -Z, then the dot. B I Z G I Z W I Z dot B I Z Gizwiz dot biz. Uh, that's Dick's special, professionally designed <laughs> site. And yeah. uh, and if you click the uh, Gizwiz visits the tech guy button, it's got a picture of me. You'll see all the things he's recommended on the show. There's lots of other things. You did World News Now a couple of weeks ago. I I know you've got all your your gadgets from World for Insomniacs from World News Now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there's also Mad Collectibles. Dick wrote for the match game for years. He He's kind of the legend that saved the match game. If you want to read that story and even get some old match game questions, he sells those on uh, on his site. Gizwiz.biz. The, the, there is a game for us all to play, though, the What the Heck Is It contest. That'll run out at the end of the year, so you got a little bit more time. Just identify this close-up of a gizmo or a gadget, if you know what it is, or even if you don't, you're in the running 
for an autographed copy of Mad Magazine, Gizwiz. Perfect. Biz. Thank you, Dickie D. Don't forget his Thank podcast, you, too, gizwiz.tv. Have a great day. Perfect. How you was your too, pineapple buddy. upside down cake? Pretty uh, good? You know what? We didn't do it. We went out and bought a pumpkin pie. It was not like a normal Thanksgiving, you know? Tell so me I, about I, it for any yeah. of us. Yeah. We didn't have any company. No. We just thought, you know, we're going to buy a pie. Buy a pie. <laughs> it was a buy a pie Thanksgiving. It was a buy a pie. We'll never exactly. forget it. Yeah. Thank you, Dickie D. <laughs> okay, buddy. Take, take care. care. See you next week. Thanks to Lady Laura, our musical director, Kim Schaffer, the phone angel. Thanks most of all to you for making my day today. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'll be back uh, for another show next time. Give you a little more uh, review of my new Apple Macintosh and anything else on your mind we could talk about, including Mercury Space Manuals. See you later. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.